509. I would like to call to order the regular meeting of the Minneapolis Park and Recreation Board, February 5th. And I would ask the secretary to please call the roll. Commissioner Bourne. Here. Commissioner Hassan. Here. Commissioner Severson. Present. Commissioner Meyer. Present. Commissioner French. Present. President Hogan. Here. You have a form. Thank you. Um, at this time, I would, at this time, I would like to move uh, the approval of the agenda with a um, couple of amendments. I would like to remove from consent resolution 2020-126. Uh, move that to. Um, new business. That's something I can do. Um, and I would also like to uh, remove uh, resolution 2019-426 as we will be considering a similar resolution. Uh, in new business. Do I have um, a motion? A motion? Um, I have one other thing to add. I just want to make sure. So I, just before this meeting, I was informed that what was scheduled to be on the planning committee, resolution 2020-131, uh, which is a resolution um, authorizing a, a minimum of 45-day public review, that was supposed to be on consent. Um, so I would add that to Okay. In fact, so an adding resolution 2020 131 to consent. Yes, uh, President Cogill, I would also uh, I would also ask to amend the agenda under uh, under new business to add a resolution. Uh, directing staff to reallocate $100,000 of the Walter D. Sick Memorial Innovation Fund to specifically target communities in the East African and Somali community in and around the Cedar Riverside area. Okay. Um, uh, do you have the resolution? Uh, no. With you? <laughs> I, okay. I can get there by the time we get there, but the secretary, I think, also okay. probably heard it. I would second it. Are, are all of those have all of those uh, amendments been heard? By I would split the question. Yes. All right. Fantastic. President Colgill, just to um, reaffirm the motion, I, I'd, I'd like the amendment to the uh, Diesel Innovation Fund staff direction to occur on the top of the agenda and new business. No, excuse me. The top of the the top of the agenda. Um, between after the approval of the minutes before the vote officers. I'm asking that new business be moved to in between the approval of the agenda and reports of officers. And I am saying that I will add that resolution to new business, but I will not be moving new business before reports of officers. Yeah, I'm, I'm asking for a vote to rearrange the order of the agenda. Okay, after we, is, is that? When the agenda is approved, I will be asking for oh. a vote to move on the sequence of business. Understood. I would like to request from council advice if that is uh, compliant with our, with our rules. Do we have uh, a specific order that they need to be? Mr. Chair, I'm referring to the members of the board to uh, board rule section 15. It sets forth the order of business, um, and uh, it's set under your rules. Um, you could uh, entertain uh, Commissioner Bourne's motion, but it would take a two-thirds vote because it's, in essence, suspending your rules. So the rules provide the order, which is reports of officers, reports of appointees outside, two, three consent, four, 
reports of special committee, five reports of standing committee, six unfinished business, seven new business. So the board is bound by those rules unless you have a two thirds vote to suspend those rules, change the order of business. There is uh, a motion on the floor with the um, uh, amended agenda um, as stated. Um, do I have a second? Second. There's been a motion and a second. All those in favor? Right. Hold on, oh, Commissioner Meyer. First, you would have to suspend, suspend the rules before you would take that action. And I would speak against suspending the rules. Uh, the motion that Commissioner Bourne has just proposed was something that was uh, considered in our budget um, last year uh, and was rejected on a 6-2 vote, including Commissioner Bourne. Uh, I think it's inappropriate to be... Um, I move to call the question on the agenda. Second. The question has been called. Um, all those in favor of the agenda... I right, have to suspend. This requires a suspension of the rules first. Yeah. To rearrange the order. Actually, no, first you have to do previous question first. Which takes two minutes. Okay, so this is the previous question. The approval of the, approval of the agenda. All those in favor of the approval of the agenda, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? You didn't, you didn't you need to take a vote on the previous yeah, question. Yeah, clarity, please. Okay. I'm sorry. We're taking a vote on the previous question. No, you have to take a vote to move previous question, which requires two thirds to begin with, and then you have a vote on the actual previous question. Okay. And, and the, the question is about, sorry. And then you <coughs> No, no, I, I just would like clarity of what, what question are we? Secretary of the Sorry. President Comia, I think. Um, the, pre, the, the conversation on previous question and a request to call the question is the same piece, and I think what's being articulated is that first, you have to vote on calling the question or previous question as uh, Commissioner Meyer is saying, so then that establishes whether we would vote on the amendment. And then you'd have to do suspension of the rules after previous question, question and then move to Commissioner Boyd's amendment. Correct. If the intent is to vote on actually moving the item to of new business up on the agenda or just adding the item to the agenda? <coughs> Seeing no other lights. <laughs> previous question. I am moving for the previous question. All those in favor of the pre of previous question, please signify by saying aye. 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 Uh, any opposed abstentions? That carries. Suspension of the rules. So now I would like a motion to suspend the rules. To Point of order, Commissioner yes. Cogill, I think first we are voting to approve the agenda, and then we can look at a suspension of the rules to remove the, to move the order of the agenda. I appreciate that, Commissioner Bourne. It sounds like there's some disagreement among commissioners about which is next, but uh, I would uh, entertain a mo motion to approve the agenda. With which change is made? The following change is made to reiterate. Uh, removing resolution 2016-126 from consent. Um, what is it, one? 126. 126. Adding to consent resolution 2020-131. And in addition, removing from unfinished business resolution 2019-426. And finally, adding to new business the resolution that Commissioner Bourne suggested regarding funding in the Cedar Riverside neighborhood. Commissioner Music. I just wanted to ask a clarifying question. So you said we're removing resolution 2019-426? Yes. Correct. Due to the fact that there is a similar resolution in new business. Okay. So it, the one in new business is replacing the old Correct. resolution. Okay. And then the other item that we're moving into the consent agenda is what's currently in planning committee? 
2021-31, which is related to the 45-day public review. That is correct. Okay. And then Commissioner Boren also added another one. I would like to split that vote. Do we have to vote down that first before I can propose the alternative agenda that does not have that on it? We will have to vote on this slate. Um, so, Mr. Chair, I think you can always divide a question. Yeah. I, any, any questions divisible? So it's a series of amendments. You could take them all as one, or you could move to divide. Them. So I would seek to divide the vote to add the three changes um, that you mentioned first, but excluding the amendment by Commissioner Bourne. Point of parliamentary inquiry, President Colgill. Yes. Uh, Parliamentarian Rice it is a request to divide that's only accepted if there's unanimous consent to divide. Otherwise, it's a vote to divide? No. Okay. Mr. President, any member at any time can request to divide any okay. state issue. Okay. Okay. Uh, the question has, has been requested that the question be divided. Therefore, at this time, uh, I would like to uh, ask for uh, a motion to amend the agenda with all stated amendments, excluding Commissioner Borden's recommended amendment. So moved. Second. All those in favor of... Uh, ask for a roll call. A uh, roll call has been requested. Um, Secretary Ringel, please call the roll. Commissioner Bourne. Abstain. Commissioner Musage. Aye. Commissioner Severson? No. Commissioner Meyer? Aye. Commissioner Hassan? No. Commissioner French? No. Commissioner Forney? Aye. President Kogia? Aye. You have four ayes, three nays, one abstain, and one absent. Um, thank you, Secretary Ringle. That motion carries. Uh, now moving on to the uh, second <laughs> question, which is adding, um, is Commissioner Bourne's uh, request to add a uh, second item under new business? Can we repeat, repeat that? Uh, Commissioner Bourne, could you repeat your requested motion? Uh, Yes, I'll restate the uh, intent of the motion. I believe the video record has the exact wording of the motion. Uh, the intent of the motion is to provide staff direction in the allocation of the DTSIC Innovation Fund um, of, of $100,000 to be targeted towards uh, East African youth in the uh, Somali community in and around the Cedar Riverside area. Uh, that motion, uh, or the uh, proposed uh, language has been stated. Um, so, uh, so with that, I would uh, request uh, that the secretary please take the roll on this Is vote. it received a second? Oh, uh, although, uh, yes. Second. There's been a motion and a second for the additional amendment to the agenda. President. President Colville, may I make one um, clarifying question first? Yes. Is this intended to be existing dollars or new dollars? This is intended to be existing dollars. Uh, with the consent of the seconder, I would withdraw the motion to amend the agenda. Well, if it doesn't, yeah. if you're not doing it, he doesn't he need to second anyway. No. Someone else would have to second it. So I am withdrawing withdraw the motion. You're withdrawing the, the motion to amend the agenda. Correct. Thank you, uh, President or uh, Commissioner Bourne. Uh, I move to approve the minutes of Wednesday, December 11th, 2019. Uh, there has been a motion. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor of approving the minutes of Wednesday, December the 11th, 2019, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? That carries. We'll now move into reports of officers. Superintendent Fangora. Thank you, uh, President Kogil, Commissioners, and welcome, everybody. Um, I'll start off with uh, athletics, aquatics, and ice arenas. 
Aquatics on Tuesday, January 28th, the Minneapolis Public School Boys Swim Team and Dive Team hosted and won the Senior Night at Phillips Aquatic Center, PAC. Our second session of Winter Swim Lessons, Winter B, kicked off Monday, February 3rd. Uh, youth Sports. Uh, basketball, hockey, and wrestling kicked off their winter season on January 5th and are going great so far. Uh, current numbers, uh, basketball, 160 plus teams, hockey, 28 teams, and wrestling, 10 teams. Those are great numbers. Um, adult sports, winter sports is going strong so far in 2020. Current numbers, adult basketball, 54 teams. Broomball, 211 teams. Dodgeball, 14 teams. Pond hockey, 14 teams. And volleyball, 157 teams. Adult Broomball uh, end of season tournament final games at Parade Ice Arena is on February 7th and 8th. Uh, golf, uh, reminder that the annual Minneapolis Golf Summit is being held on Saturday, February 29th from 11 o'clock a.m. to 4 o'clock p.m. at Columbia Manor. Uh, so leap into the 2020 golf season. Uh, this is leap year. That, was, that didn't work too well. I, I should have done better than that. I'm <laughs> I should have rehearsed that. Oh, man. Uh, recreation centers and programs. Longfell and Luxon Parks held their annual fire and ice festival over the past two weekends. Hundreds of participants came out uh, for ice skating, refreshments, uh, community building, and activities. Uh, youth development. The youth program specialist spent the week on January 13th through 17th in training, team building, and professional development. Special thanks to Othegra Williams um, and all of her work and to the youth line staff for their participation and involvement. And I spent some time down there, I popped in a couple of times, and it was wonderful sessions and uh, very grateful for the team and, uh, and how they're moving forward on this new initiative. So congratulations to that team and uh, thanks again to Tyrese uh, Assistant Superintendent of uh, Recreation, Tyrese Cox. Thank you. So in honor of Dr. Dr. Martin Luther, Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., the participants of Rec Plus created murals to display in park buildings across Minneapolis. While creating the murals, children worked with staff and child care specialists, uh, Elise Smoen, uh, Colleen uh, Herbert, and Ryan Winman, or Widman to learn about MLK and his mission. The murals are still on display to remind and demonstrate that we are not only spreading MLK's, Martin Luther King's message during his day of remembrance, but every day of the year. Pictured projects, uh, HSP, Kenwood, Lyndhurst, and Wyndham. So beautiful murals, wonderful work by our, our youth. Uh, Bassett Creek, this is planning. Bassett Creek feasibility study, removal of accumulated sediment. The Bassett Creek Watershed Management Commission, the BCWMC, in cooperation with the Minneapolis, uh, Minneapolis and uh, Recreation Board and the City of Minneapolis is studying the feasibility of removing accumulated sediment from Bassett Creek within Theodoreth Regional Park. There is an open house at the trailhead scheduled uh, from, or for Thursday, February 27th between 6 o'clock p.m. and 7.30 p.m. The proposed project will remove sediment that has collected in lagoons created along the creek in Worth Park in the 1930s by the Civilian Conservation Corps. Uh, the, goal is, uh, the goal of the proposed uh, dredging projects are to provide multiple benefits, including reducing some flooding of the Worth Chalet parking lot and a short section of the Theta Worth Parkway, improving flow capacity and floodplain storage of the creek by removing some uh, islands that have formed, and improving habitat for fish and macro invertebrates. Uh, all are welcome to come to the open house to hear about alternatives being studied, get questions answered, and provide feedback. The Minnehaha Parkway Regional Trail Concept Discussion. Community Advisory Committee number 12 will be held on February 10th, 2020 from 6 o'clock to 8 o'clock p.m. at the Reverend Arthur Martin Luther King Jr. Recreation Center at 4055 Nicollet Avenue in Minneapolis. Updated concepts for the master plan will be discussed together with the discussion of all portions of the Minnehaha Parkway Regional Trail west of Cedar Avenue. The committee will revisit all concepts and potentially make recommendations on the various design elements. The public is welcome to attend the meeting and provide comments. Uh, forestry, forestry crews 
work to make the lake at the, uh, the Lake of the Isles and Minnehaha dog parks safe uh, by pruning dead tree limbs. In the process, they made friends with some of our canine visitors. That's a cute photo. I like that. Um, great work. Great work by them. Uh, maintenance operations. Rinks. Focused on keeping the rink, the, the rinks, ice rinks safe and open during the warm weather conditions. Uh, lake ice is not as abundant as previous years, and we are assessing the possibility of needing to remove rinks from lake ice earlier than normal, uh, specifically Lake of the Isles. So just to be aware of that, and uh, we'll also, of course, keep you informed. Um, I will say I see a lot of times um, a lot of the rinks, and just to commend our, uh, our teams out there doing the work, they do a fabulous job with our ice rink. So congratulations to them and, and Jeremy, great work on that. So um, 2019 compost recycling competition. The 2019 season has wrapped up uh, and the numbers, yes. Oh, yes, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Superintendent Bangora and uh, thank you, Commissioner Hassan also for noting uh, the time. It looks like uh, Secretary Ringgold has gone to get our list um, and with that, in the meantime, I can quickly go over um, our rules for open time. Um, uh, you're, anybody who's allowed to speak, you can sign up uh, by 3 p.m. the day of the board meeting. Uh, we don't, uh, you can speak on any subject. We don't debate um, uh, while uh, speakers are um, coming forward to speak. Um, I'll allocate two minutes uh, for each speaker this evening. And um, uh, also want to note we don't um, t tolerate any harassing or discriminatory language. Okay. Um, and uh, the the two items that you uh, we ask you not speak on include um, any pending litigation um, or personnel uh, matters. Um, with that, we have a good number of folks signed up here to speak this evening. Um, again, I, I did say uh, two minutes um, for each speaker, and um, for when each speaker comes up, if you could state your name and if you're comfortable, your address for the record, um, and you will, you will have two minutes. Um, the first speaker that we have this evening is Beth Popoliski. Uh, Beth, if you would want to state your name and if you're comfortable, your address, and you have two minutes. Hi, my name is Beth Popoliski. I live at 3821 Aldrich Avenue South. More than 20 years ago, I attended the East Harriet Farmstead board meeting to express my support of offering tours of the Theaterworth home. The board supported the tours then and continues to do so today. Since then, the Minneapolis Parks Legacy Society has invested over $100,000 and countless hours creating tours. They've gotten the house on the National Historic Register. They own over 350 artifacts and the primary documents needed to get this house elevated to the status of a National Historic Landmark. There are only three others in the city. This designation could and should be a feather in the cap of our park system. The tours have become part of the edu community education catalog of Minneapolis Public Schools, and the Legacy Society has piloted tours with school groups, and a program for children is ready to launch. The Worth House is a touchstone for the tours, and it helps people to understand how Worth did his work and developed our park system. Kids come on the tour, and they get to see the history of the park in their own neighborhood and have the chance to design their own park. I'm an educator of 35 years, and I get thrilled thinking about the programming that we could possibly develop around this house. What an opportunity to connect kids to the history of our parks, to instill pride in them, and to foster future park stewards of our system. To offer exclusive use of the house to the superintendent will cost the community access to the historical tours, educational programming, and an opportunity to elevate this house to the level of the National Historic Landmark and the grant money that follows that designation. Please find a way to work with the Minneapolis Parks Legacy Society to continue the tours of the Theaterworth House. The loss of the people you are elected to serve is too great not to do so. Thank you very much. Thank you. I have picture. I'm going to submit pictures with, of the kids in the house that you have been on the tours. You can do so to, okay. to Don, who's right over uh, to your left. Um, our next speaker is uh, Lisa McDonald. Lisa, if you would come forward, state your name, and if you're comfortable, your address for the record. 
You have two minutes. Thank you, Chair Cowgill and commissioners. I'm Lisa McDonald. I live at 4241 East Lake Harriet Parkway. As a council member in the city of Minneapolis from 1993 to 2001, I worked closely with the Park Board and the Minneapolis Historic Preservation Commission to have the Worth House designated locally in recognition of Theodore Worth and the home's significance in the creation of our top tier park system. I am here to, subsequently, the home was placed on the National Historic Register and could potentially be elevated to a National Historic Landmark. With that designation, the Park Board would be eligible for grants and funding for the home. I am here today to encourage the Park Board to negotiate a lease that allows the superintendent to live at the Worth home and for the tours to continue. The superintendent receives a $175,000 annual salary. Even with paying rent, he will not have to pay taxes while living in the house or utilities and maintenance, including mowing and snow removal, which will be by park staff. Tours should also continue in the home because they provide a backdrop and an understanding of how Worth came to his decisions about park design and use and that parks should be for the people. Having tours off-site diminishes the story. In addition, Worth's son Conrad, who subsequently ran the national park system, took the lessons he learned from his father and used them in the design of many national parks. Minneapolis was an incubator for systems and ideas now in use all over the United States. Our last superintendent, Jane Miller, lived in the house and the public used the first floor for meetings. Our current governor, who's paid almost $128,000, lives in the governor's mansion and agrees to do so with tours and events occurring. I'm a member of the 1006 Society and we arrange many of those events. I would also ask that the lease ensure that while living in the house, it not be altered in any way that would damage or change the historic designation status with the long-term goal of this publicly owned building becoming a national historic landmark. Thank you. Thank you, um, Ms. McDonald. Our next speaker is uh, Emmer Griffin. Hopefully I got that right. Ms. Griffin, if you would come forward and state your name, and if you're comfortable, your address for the record, you have two minutes. Uh, hello, thank you. Uh, my name is Emmer Griffin, and I'm a resident of Minneapolis. Uh, <laughs> Sorry, having a moment about my own street address, uh, 3824 16th Avenue South. Um, I am here, I'm the mother of two children, and I am here to advocate for the immediate end of pesticide use in all of the parks. I noticed immediately upon becoming a mother that I spent much more time in all of our city parks. Um, they're an important source of green space for many families. They're the only accessible source of green space. And children are at a greater risk of pesticide exposure uh, due to their stage of growth and development and natural behaviors such as crawling, putting things in their mouth, um, and all ways of experiencing the world that are fundamentally different from adults. Children also have more permeable skin, they taste touch things, and their metabolic pathways are more immature. Um, EPA studies on environmental health threats to children show that th because their internal organs are still developing, they're less able to detoxify chemicals. I would urge the Parks Board to immediately end all pesticide use. It must be a priority um, for equity for all of our children in the city and, uh, and their health. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Ms. Griffin, our next speaker is Anita Newhouse. Anita, if you would come forward and state your name, if you're comfortable, your address for the record, and you have two minutes. Thank you for this time. Uh, my name is Anita Newhouse, and I live at 4500 Wentworth in the Kingfield neighborhood. Um, I'm also here to talk to you today about pesticide use in our parks. Um, I uh, have a background in, I would have been a K through five educator. I have eight years in MPS teaching kindergarten and second grade. I have worked in healthcare. I have graduate studies in occupational therapy, in social work, and in pu public policy most recently. And um, a little public health along the way. Um, and I emailed you all something today. Um, you may or may not have had access to it yet, but I emailed you one of the seminal public health studies um, 
of our generation, basically, that is used as one of the, by both sides, in the pesticide kind of argument, um, position, debate. Because it, it provides basically raw data. You can take anything out of it you want, basically, to make it say what you want. What I wanted to um, draw your attention to were two things. First of all, the first thing, the date. It's from 2004. Since 2004, we've had data that conclusively, concretely shows what pesticide use in public spaces does to people. As a healthcare provider, I have a lot of issue with the kinds of harms that we routinely, um, we routinely put upon our citizens. Um, and as a matter of equity, I want you to look at uh, when you have a chance. This whole study hinges on one sentence that's most relevant to this day and age. And it states, genetic variation influences human susceptibility to pesticides. We know more now, since 20, 2004. We know that, as a matter of equity, some people are more susceptible than others. And it's our duty to take that into consideration when we make our policy. Thank you, Ms. Newhouse. Our next speaker is Sean Connedy. Sean, if uh, you <coughs> would state your name, and if you're comfortable, your address for the record. And you have two minutes. Hello. Uh, thanks. Uh, Sean Connerty, 4053 23rd Avenue South, uh, Minneapolis, Standish neighborhood. Um, <clears throat> so I come to you as the steward and chair of Friends of Lake Hiawatha, and, uh, or I mean, I'm the steward of Lake Hiawatha as well. Um, so over the past five years of my work at, at our parks and the Mississippi River, uh, I've learned and become painfully aware of the fragile and tenuous nature of our ecological balance that we are currently holding. Um, I have seen the disappearance of some species at Lake Hiawatha uh, with elevated levels of the pesticide triclopyr, levels high enough to, to warrant additional testing, uh, which revealed repeated spikes that are occurring along Minnehaha Creek. And uh, uh, triclopyr is toxic to aquatic life and humans, and it is an example of a pesticide that is routine, routinely used by the park board uh, to treat invasive species. Um, so this, uh, when, when there are reasonable alternatives to, to approaching invasives. Um, so, um, and with the recent disappearance of protections by the EPA, um, we ask you to become an example for our city and to counter that uh, toxic narrative and ask you uh, to move forward with the uh, transitions to organic with our parks uh, as quickly as possible. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Connedy. Our next speaker is Mike Lynch. Mike, if you'd come forward, state your name, and if you're comfortable, your address for the record, and you have two minutes. Hello, commissioners. Uh, I'm Mike Lynch. I live in the Longfellow neighborhood, and I'm co-chair of the Pesticide Advisory Committee. Um, I think this is an opportunity to re-emphasize what I came before the board in December to request a informed and thoughtful public engagement process so that we can actually receive input from stakeholders and the community, and it doesn't a uh, it is actually an informed, thoughtful process instead of a I don't want to go there. Um, so I want to reemphasize that our committee will meet February 20th, and that will be the first opportunity we will have to discuss this timeline discussion. And it will be on our agenda, and we would like to even have an opportunity to discuss it. So we have a bunch of new members. Thank you very much, and I look forward to working with them. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Lynch. Um, our next speaker is Julia Venetta? Venata? Julia, are you here? Banana, banana. <laughs> <laughs> banana, banana, banana. Uh, <laughs> if you would state your name and if you're comfortable, your address for the record, and you have two minutes. My name is Julia Venata. I'm a 42-year resident of the Longfellow community in Minneapolis. 
And I'm also, and I didn't say this last time, but I'm a 10 plus year volunteer at the Nokomis Naturescape. I was part of the original planning committee for the very successful and popular Monarch Festival. And I have participated in nearly every, as an educator at the Minneapolis Pollinator Party. So um, that's primarily my activity with the park since my daughter is an adult. Uh, thank you, commissioners, for allowing me to once again testify regarding my concerns about process and actions of members of the Pesticide Action CAC. First, let me offer my support of the recommendation to enter into a test period for organic turf management of the Fort Snelling Golf Course. This is the step in the right direction towards managing all grass areas, not just for golf, in a way that is safe for both humans and wildlife without the use of toxic chemicals. In addition to humans who share this earth, I am concerned about the health of native bees, pollinators, all insects, birds that feed on insects, and other wildlife in the food chain. There are members of this committee who are trained and knowledgeable on how to restore and manage and maintain natural areas. And there is a subgroup of the current committee who has met privately to undermine the efforts of the full committee, attempting to push through an agenda that does not allow for sustainable and feasible methods of managing invasive species, which at some times may require the use of an herbicide. Very much so. Not in great quantities, however. <laughs> so I ask for you to be open to allowing the committee as appointed and directed by the Minneapolis Park and Recreation Board to do its due diligence to advise not only on how we manage our play areas, but on how we restore and manage natural habitat areas. Sorry, I ran over. Bye. Thank you, Mrs. Venetta. Uh, our next speaker is Roxanne Stewer. 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 <laughs> Ms. Stewer, if you would state your name, if you're comfortable with your Certainly. address for the record, and you have two minutes. All right. I'm Roxanne Stewer. I'm a resident at 4055 25th Avenue South in Minneapolis. I am uh, a friend of Lake Hiawatha, and I have been working in the green industry for 38 years. I am testifying today because I really want you to consider strongly uh, the removal of pesticides and herbicides in our parks and to go organic. And I'm going to make my point by demonstration. So I have two bottles of water. We see these in the stores. Spring water. If I said to anybody in this room, would you be willing to take a drink? And it's a closed bottle, you might be willing to do so. If I said one of these bottles has your favorite herbicide in it, would you be willing? If you, look at, if you look at this container as our water shed or um, the groundwater system, and this is our soil, we take the water, and let's say we don't know what's in this bottle. It's going through our soil system. And I invited Russ up here because I didn't know if I would need some help supporting this. But um, as you can see, it's going through the soil and into the watershed, our watershed, that, for it f that feeds the springs that put goes into this bottle. Okay, now I'm gonna take this bottle. Perhaps this is the one with the herbicide in it. Now, we don't know <laughs> which bottle had herbicide or if either has an herbicide, but ultimately, this is uh, leading to the demise of our soils and our watersheds. And I'm going to ask you, would anybody be willing to drink this? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sir. Um, I always appreciate demonstration. Um, our next speaker is uh, Bernadette Gnabley. Uh, Bernadette, are you here? Yes. Wonderful. Bernadette, if you'd come forward and state your name, and if you're comfortable, your address for the record, and you have two minutes. 
Hello, Commissioners. My name is Bernadette Canabley. I reside at 2741 Bryant. Um, I came to talk about the issue of pesticides in the park and what that means for parks management, really. And um, I'm always tempted to digress into the delicious and wonderful world of soil and water science, but I'm actually going to move sort of into the future. And with spring coming, and the movement that we find in nature, I want you to th uh, be able to consider a park management system without pesticides. And I think that's only going to happen with human effort and time. And it is really a way to mobilize and connect the residents in Minneapolis because I believe that it would uh, greatly expand the duties of park staff in order to manage without pesticides. I've had a lot of experience with trying to get, you know, like um, landscape companies and et cetera to help me work on projects that I have to um, bring soil from a, from a sort of a contaminated state to something healthy. And they never, they always want to use the pesticides because it's easy and it's fast and it's economical. And I suggest that we will not be able to manage the parks differently unless there's a really strong um, partnership between volunteers and regular citizens and the park board themselves. I personally work on a number of projects. I have been working on the loose drive around Lake of the Isles and I. I have a permit through the Lena neighborhood to work on a section of the Midtown Greenway. And um, I've been working hard for about six years. And I know that it's hard work, but I think we can do it together. Thank you, Ms. Knabley. Our next speaker is Kay Hansen. Kay, if you would come forward, state your name, and if you're comfortable, your address for the record, and you have two minutes. Kay. Kay Hansen, 1614 Harmon Place, the Loring Park neighborhood, and I'm also here for Friends of Minneapolis Wildlife. Uh, regarding pesticides, you have all the information you need. There's nothing I can add to this discussion that you don't already know. Now it's just a question of what you will do with what you know. So instead, I want to share the words of Carl Frisch. He's a political strategist and recently elected Virginia School Board member. Quote, we can't wait for Donald Trump and his cronies because Trump is doing nothing. In fact, he's making things worse. It's not just in action at this point. His cronies are running every aspect of the government and are doing everything they can to reverse decades of progress and to go further. Every level of government must step up. County supervisors, city councils, school boards, parks and recreation. Everybody should be doing something. End quote. It's past time for the Minneapolis Parks and Rec to step up. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Hansen. Um, our next speaker is Joe Hesla. Joe, if you could come forward, state your name, and if you're comfortable, your address for the record, and you have two minutes. My name is Joe Hesla, and I live at 3519 23rd Avenue South, and I'm here to speak uh, for the complete ban of pesticides, and I have a subversive subgroup that are here to help me. <clears throat> One, two, three, four. Banning pesticides forever. Pollinators are a treasure. We don't want no half measures in Minneapolis parks. Again. Banning pesticides forever. Pollinators are a treasure. We don't want no half measures in Minneapolis parks. Pass the Pass pesticide the ban. ban. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Hessler. Our next speaker is Mark Rosenberg. Mark, are you here? Mark, if you would come forward, state your name, and if you're comfortable, your address for the record. You have two minutes. Good evening, uh, 3104 West Lake Street. I would like to thank the Minneapolis Park and Rec Board uh, commissioners and staff for their courage and commitment in their efforts and willingness to transition to safe alternatives to pesticides. 
We have reached a point of no return. No return to practices that pose a health risk to wildlife and people who work and play in the Minneapolis park system. Thank you for this opportunity. Thank you, uh, Mr. Rosenberg. Our next speaker is Jim Lovestar. Jim, if you would come forward, state your name, and if you're comfortable, your address for the record, and you have two minutes. My name is Jim Lovestar, 2629 Upton Avenue North. I want to start with a clarification. The word pesticide implies that the substance kills only pests. The substance kills a lot of things besides pests. Fifty years ago, I was in the Marine Corps. The U.S. government told the troops in Vietnam that Agent Orange would not harm them. Since the war in Vietnam ended, tens of thousands of former Marines, Army, and Air Force personnel have died of cancer. They didn't die like that. They had long lingering deaths caused by Agent Orange. The VA administration has validated the cause, Agent Orange. Poison. We were told it was a pesticide. Poison. I talked with a gentleman who was spraying Powderhorn Park a few years ago. We talked about why he was spraying the dandelions. He said the neighbors don't want the dandelions spreading into their yards. Since then, my research has indicated that simply mowing the dandelions before they go to seed would prevent the spread. Today I was reading an article about China, written by James Fallows for The Nation magazine. He was very clear. He said that even with the centralized government of China, the authoritarian government of China, it's the local government bodies that make most of the decisions and set the policy for the everyday people in China. I call on you to step up. Thank you, Mr. Lovestar. Our next speaker is Annette Smith. Annette, if you would come forward and state your name and if you're comfortable, your address for the record and you have two minutes. My name is Nettie Smith and I live at 2629 Upton Avenue North. So I've been listening and um, I've lived to 71 years in Minneapolis and love the parks, oh my God. Right by Theodore Worth now. And I um, listen to the arguments and or what people are saying. It seems like most people that are speaking are saying, ban the pesticides. And to me, duh, that makes sense. I mean, we all know climate emergency. It's bad. It's really bad. And so whatever we can possibly do. So here's something that we can do in Minneapolis. <clears throat> but what I would like to ask you now, um, I'm a Quaker. I, um, Quakers, <clears throat> you may know, worship in silence. And when we have silence, we don't tell people or anybody who we're having, who we're seeking from the divine, what, what the divine is. We don't define that for anybody. It could be your conscience, could be higher power. I'm just suggesting that the remainder of my time, 30 seconds, that we um, <clears throat> hold silence and ask for a deeper wisdom. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Smith. Um, the 
We have a time certain item, but we do have just about two minutes, uh, which is perfect uh, for our one, one more speaker until our time certain public hearing. And our, our next speaker is Mr. Al Flowers. Al, if you come forward to state your name, if you come up with your address for the record, and you have two minutes. Oh, I'm glad you did that then, you know, because that would have been hard. Uh, uh, first, uh, 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 thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. I, uh, I came because uh, I wanted to uh, uh, say something about uh, this legacy committee. The community, uh, people in the community called me about what's happening with the superintendent. He, had, he knows nothing about it, but they come to me with issues, and they got an issue with what's happening to the superintendent uh, 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 with this legacy committee. And I would ask the legacy committee to try to do this offline because it's, it's, uh, I think it's kind of disrespectful with uh, the, what they're doing, throwing his salary up, uh, you know, like he's still on the plantation or something. The Minnesota have changed. And so you, uh, you change Calhoun Beach, you, you can make changes. And, and uh, to disrespect this uh, superintendent uh, and not work with him to see what's feasible for him and his family is outrageous. And, uh, and I told people to stand back today, tonight. I said, no, just hold up, because it's crazy to me if they can't work this out with the superintendent or if you can't have another way for this to happen without being uh, disrespectful. That's how we feel as an African-American. I'm saying that's how people in the community, and I told the young people to hold up. Uh, uh, y'all, y'all stay back. We don't need to do that. I hope y'all work it out because we can get just as loud as everybody else. I'm saying we want the chair to have a couple of good months. So be careful on what you're asking for and who's on that committee of diversity. Who is the, where's the diversity? I'd like to know what that committee is. And then the uh, last one to the superintendent, Corky Wiseman, Serena Gibbs, are powerful people in our community. We lost a historian the last couple of weeks in Mr. Ron Edwards. And he, uh, and he left here with nothing, bought six decades, your uh, attorney up there, Brian Rice, knows him. Six decades of fighting against the institution that they, and they didn't like him. They didn't like him, but we gave him an honorable burial for the work he has been has done. And Corky Wiseman and Serena is instrumental in how we uh, try to continue to bring Juneteenth. It's very important that we have that connection because they were at the funeral. I didn't tell them to come to the funeral. They came to the funeral because they know our community. So you got to uh, take make sure that we have that going into the summer. We don't need to lose a Corky Wiseman or Serena as we're trying to rebuild Juneteenth and I'm, I'm to the board really on this legacy committee if it, where's is it any diversity on there because we don't i don't know who to call so maybe i ask do i ask don that too um who, who's on the legacy committee uh that is a good question i may have to defer you to uh deputy superintendent ringold okay who, deputy who, yeah. who i'm asking mm -hmm. oh, oh oh i didn't know you were deputy super but yeah okay then i asked thank, her thank you mr but, uh, thank you yeah, mr yeah, flowers more power than I thought, but, um okay, at this you. time um it it is uh six o'clock and we do have a time certain public hearing uh regarding uh amending chapter 15 of the minneapolis park and recreation board, board code of ordinances um we do not have any speakers signed up um, and I don't see anybody rushing to the podium. Um, and so I will uh, open the public hearing and I will ask if there's anybody here to speak. Is there anybody here to speak? Is there anybody here to speak on amending chapter 15 of the Minneapolis Park and Recreation Board Court of Ordinances? Seeing none, um, I will close the public hearing and move back into open time. We do have uh, about eight, seven more uh, speakers, and our next speaker is Chesney Enquist. Chesney, you have two minutes. Thank you. My name is Chesney Enquist. I'm wearing a yellow bandana, so I might have something wild to say right now. I've addressed this body repeatedly about the harms of pesticide use and the community's commitment to a democratically-led process for transitioning to organics. Over a year ago, 
This prompted this body to unanimously create a pesticide advisory committee. And now that community is placing a call to recommend that that committee set an expedited timeline for their work. This is the work that allows us to take measures to protect the most vulnerable among us. So you're going to hear the, uh, the committee start talking about things like vulnerable populations and sensitive exposure windows. Um, this will refer to people like women and their children in the parks at times of conception, during pregnancy, in utero, early life, neonatal, juvenile periods, pubertal development, and adolescence. The work that we're talking about doing here is facilitating intervention for this organization to disrupt and heal patterns of chemical abuse that are dividing our community with disease. We are talking about ending the ground war in our parks. We are talking about disrupting and healing catastrophic patterns of colonialism and white supremacy that are oppressing basic human rights and are at the basis of massive ecological devastation. The committee has identified that organic practices are ready, readily available, feasible, and affordable. And so it is that we will respond to the community's call to work on an expedited timeline to protect the most vulnerable among us. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Ms. Enquist. Next speaker is Russ Henry. Russ, if you'd state your name, you're comfortable your address for the record, and you have two minutes. President Cogill, commissioners, my name is Russ Henry, and I am a Minneapolis resident. I am the chair of the Minneapolis Parks Pesticide Advisory Committee. And I uh, want to clear up a couple of, well, one major myth about pesticides in parks that I hear some proponents of the ongoing use of pesticides continue to bring up. And that is that we don't use pesticides where kids play. Well, let me just address that very clearly, because we use pesticides exactly where kids play. We use pesticides in our premier baseball fields that we're renting out to youth leagues. We're having kids dive into 2,4-D. The gentleman who spoke about Agent Orange, 2,4-D is half of the ingredients for Agent Orange. We're putting that on our ball fields where kids play. We are putting pesticides the same type and even more types of pesticides in golf courses. We have youth golf uh, events and leagues that we invite youth to participate in, in our golf courses. We're putting pesticides there. Do we expect the kids aren't sitting on the ground in the golf course every now and then? I expect they are. We use pesticides in bodies of water. We use pesticides in bodies of water. The, body of waters, uh, the bodies of water where we use recently are Lake Nokomis and Loring Park Pond. We have kids swimming in Lake Nokomis and we're using pesticides on the other side of that lake. Absolutely horrible to think of the exposure that we're asking children to, uh, to endure in our park system. We're also using pesticides in gardens and in natural areas. And in both of those, we have, uh, in gardens and natural areas, we have programs for youth. We are using pesticides where kids play. It is clear. Kids play in parks. And we must end the use of pesticides in parks as quickly as possible, because if we don't, that means we are asking more children to be exposed to poisons in our park system. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Henry. Our next speaker is Cynthia Wilson. Is Cynthia here? Okay, uh, we'll come back to her if she's coming back. Um, oh, yes. <laughs> Hi, I'm wearing a different hat on this evening. Uh, good evening, commissioners. Um, I'm here on behalf of the NAACP, and we just um, are in the process of having an emergent meeting this evening in reference to Superintendent uh, Al Bangora and what has been presented to us in reference to his lodging at uh, the superintendent's home. Um, now, all I ever remember about the park board, some people call it the Theodore Worth home. All I remember is it being the superintendent's home, i.e. the superintendent. Just a little bit of historical facts. First African-American male uh, 
for the superintendent here at the Minneapolis Park and Recreation Board. Second fact, first one, living in the superintendent home. I think, uh, President Cogwheel, you said that you like demonstrations, correct? Did I hear you said that earlier? Certainly. Okay, I'm gonna give you one. <laughs> so, imagine, I'm thinking everybody here has a home. Imagine that your home, if you have a family, because I know somebody referenced Jane Miller, but I think Jane Miller lived alone and I think maybe had some cats. This man has a family. Imagine you in your home, just had dinner, you're gonna sit down for just a evening with your family and somebody pops in to do tours in your home and they're having people run in and out of your home. How would that make you feel? This is African American Black History Month. We have a group of young people who are in the, the uh, stages of connecting with our superintendent to do a piece on him. They are youth from the Junior Journalist uh, Program at Central to ask different information, ask questions about his, him being the first black superintendent and living in the superintendent home. We are very much appalled at what we've heard and we are again having an emergency meeting on this evening to find out all of the information as we will be presenting again at the next board meeting. So uh, with that in mind, we're in support of you and it should be your decision. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Wilson. Our next speaker is Carolyn Carr. Ms. Carr, if you would come forward and state your name, if you're comfortable, your address for the record, and you have two minutes. I'm Carolyn Carr. I live in the Hiawatha part of the Longfellow neighborhood. And I come here as a member of the Longfellow Environment and River Gorge Committee. For the last 15 years, we have advocated for and supported and promoted protection of the Longfellow stretch of the Mississippi River Gorge, a really important natural area. And we've, and with our partners, the National Park Service, the Park Board, with Friends of the Mississippi River, we've helped to leverage more than 10,000 hours of volunteer work to care for these natural areas. And we've relied on the assistance of the park board or professional crews to use herbicides as a particular tool in that work. And that's been very important. Uh, the work we've been able to do to protect areas that now don't need any ongoing treatment at all um, has happened because we've had this tool in our tool chest. And so while I am a climate activist, I believe in a world without herbicides and pesticides. I want that to happen. I do not want unintended consequences, negative ones, uh, to our natural areas that would allow reinvasion by the invasive plants we're working so hard to manage. Um, these natural areas that have integrity, that have plant communities that support the rest of the living system we need are essential. We can't simply eliminate pesticides and protect the planet. We need to restore the natural areas that we have and we need to consider this methodically and thoughtfully and purposefully and successfully. That's what I think. So I urge you all to uh, keep this whole picture in mind. It's not just one or the other that we're after. We're after the whole natural systems that work. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Carr. Our next speaker is Barbara Mack. Is that right? Mace, aha. Uh, Ms. Mace, if you would come forward and state your name, if you're comfortable, your address for the record, and you have two minutes. Thank you. Good evening, President Cowgill, Superintendent Bangora, and commissioners. My name is Barbara Mace. And I work with Minneapolis Parks Legacy Society. Superintendent Bangora met with us early on when he was considering living in the home. And we appreciate that meeting. Um, also, my family funded the uh, work by the firm that prepared the application for the National Registry of Historic Places, which was granted and approved in 2002. Um, I am here today to ask the board to delay negotiations to renew the superintendent's lease. Um, I would say the lease should be extended now, in the meantime, of course, um, to allow for public input and to clarify many misunderstandings that have arisen over this that I am seeing are very divisive. And 
our society wants to bring about unity and we believe that these tours accomplish that. Since the public has become aware that the tours might come to an end when the new lease is negotiated, um, there have been so many misunderstandings. Um, I'd like to just mention there have been some in the newspaper and there have been many phone calls to the Legacy Society and people are saying things that are not true. And they can be factually supported uh, and we would be very happy to provide you support for some of those. So I would like to just clarify a couple of these misunderstandings tonight. Also, allowing for public input would, I think, bring about further clarification. It would allow for clarification. Um, so one of the questions was that um, all of this, uh, about all of the superintendents and how many lived in the homes. Um, not all superintendents did live in the home, and some of them who lived in there uh, only lived in there part of the time. So there's a lot of context that was missing. The use of the home was different. Uh, our mission statement um, shows 20 years ago we started working on this project. Um, Ms. Mays, if you could Theodore wrap J. up Worth, with one or two more sentences. Thank you. Um, Theodore J. Worth, the grandson, also worked on this effort until his life ended. Um, I just want to say this story has a, this home has a story to tell, and telling it in the home enriches the lives of all who have gone on these tours. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Mace. And if you do have additional comments, you can submit them to Don for the record. Okay. Um, our next speaker is Vicki Burke. Bonk. Man, really missing them tonight. Just, just whiffing. Um, okay, uh, Vicki, if you come forward, state your name and, and if you're comfortable, your address for the record, and you have two minutes. Yeah. Vicki Bonk, and um, I live at 5629 45th Avenue South, uh, in the Comus neighborhood, and um, I, I came here to s speak on, on pesticides a bit uh, in their use. I, I don't think it's an all or nothing issue. And I've, for over 20 some years, I've worked with the park board as being the um, garden uh, stewardship coordinator at, Lake at the Lake Nokomis Naturescape. And um, my experience is that application of, of, of pesticides there was was it, it didn't come up and um, and I I think that there are times when uh, pesticide and herbicide use is necessary in ecological um, restoration and I uh, and there so I don't I, I just don't think it's an all or nothing issue. And it's like Carolyn Carr said, it's an important tool in the toolbox for restoration where more life is preserved and habitat preserved with its judicial use. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Bonk. Our final speaker is Christine Popowski. I passed. Okay. Um, that was our final speaker for the evening uh, for open time. Thank you all for coming out to speak. Um, moving on to, oh, yes, Superintendent Van Gora. Okay, yes, it's been a bit of time, but uh, oh, I'm page. happy to turn it back over to you for Thank your report. You. Thank you, President Kogel and uh, commissioners. One last page, but most always important page. Uh, 2019 compost recycling competition. Uh, in 2019 season has wrapped up uh, and a number and the numbers are in 29 total recreation centers had organics picked up at least once in 2019 that is about 67 percent of all centers 622 bins were collected for an estimated total of uh, 30,962.2 pounds of organic material being diverted fuller recreation center worked with uh, Rachel uh, Gradinsky, our Minnesota Green Corps member that leads our trash and recycling work to help create this display board to encourage their recreation centers to recycle. The board allows park attendees 
um, to take handouts on what can be recycled and composted, fun facts about waste, and a sorting game that encourages individuals to try sorting uh, the materials on the table into recycling trash and organics. Um, I love that, and, and just to think, 30,000 pounds uh, is really impressive, really well done. Uh, environmental Management Community Gardens update. Uh, this is the last uh, report. Uh, four community gardens uh, are plot ready for individuals to begin growing this spring. Uh, the four spring locations are Loring, uh, Dickman, Franklin Steel, and Towerside Parks. St. Thomas University Tommy Outdoor student volunteers are scheduled to fill the raised beds at Towerside and soil and compost uh, in April. Uh, I went to, I'm a Tommy, I went to St. Thomas, so that's pretty cool. Um, I see Jerry smiling. Uh, 14 individuals interested in serving as community garden leads and 67 plot applications received. So thank you, uh, President Cogill and commissioners for your time and uh, appreciate it, thank you. Thank you very much, Superintendent Bangora. Um, moving on to consent business, uh, I'd like uh, a motion for resolutions 2020-125 2020-127, 2020-128, and 2020-131. Is there a second? It's been moved and seconded. Is there any discussion? Commissioner Bourne. Thank you, President Cogill. I ask to pull 2020-128 from consent for discussion. Thank you, Commissioner Bourne. Um, the resolution has been moved and seconded, so at this time we would be voting on that motion. Unless I'm incorrect. About that. Respectfully, President Cogill, you're mistaken. Any commissioner can ask to pull any item from consent, and it's traditionally just a matter of course. Okay. Uh, we'll move a res. Uh, we will uh, then uh, remove resolution 2020-128 from consent, um, and I would like to have a motion then on. Resolutions 2020-125, 2020-127, and 2020-131. So motion. those have already been moved and seconded. You can just take a vote. Okay. I will. All those in favor of uh, those uh, three resolutions, uh, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Those resolutions move, are moved. Um, we'll now consider resolution 2020-128. Do I have a motion on resolution 2020-128? President Kogel, it's already been moved and seconded. Okay. Uh, Commissioner Bourne. Uh, thank you, President President Kogel. Um, I'm just looking for a little bit of background. I, I believe I know what the increase in the contract is for. I guess my first question is to Council Rice. Uh, all of the litigation around this matter is completed so it's we wouldn't have to go into closed session to discuss this um yes yeah, council right uh, president commissioner born and he'll defer to uh secretary Brinkle to handle this matter i'd be glad to answer that question once i the facts are established okay. secretary ringold uh, President Cogill, Commissioner Bourne, yes, this is um, this is complete. Uh, the final work on this was the arbitration regarding the, the police officer. That's complete. These are not intended to be new charges. This is completing the charges from the 2019 year. So this contract will be closed after this amendment. Thank you. That uh, that answers my question. Um, I, th I think this next one is to the deputy superintendent as well. Um, and I just need help with my memory on this one. When when we had passed the when we had passed the previous increases to the Littler Mendelssohn uh, PSA, we did them with a concurrent reduction from the uh, Park Police um, line of our operating budgets. Have we? Have we reduced the corresponding park police budget in our twenty in the twenty twenty budget by one hundred and ninety thousand dollars or one hundred and sixty thousand dollars to date? Uh, President uh, Cogill, um, Commissioner Bourne. So there were actually two Littler contracts. There was one Littler contract that was focusing specifically on the complaints 
around uh, the four juveniles on the July 10th incident. That ended up being $66,000 total. And that one, I believe, was directly then related to the uh, police, our police budget at $66,000. This one is a contract that had been in place um, prior to uh, 2019 and had been some uh, legal uh, services for HR um, contracts and in 2019 was also used to address the Park Police arbitration. So I do not believe, I'd have to, I see Director Wiseman is in the, um, is in the audience tonight. She might know this, but I do not believe that any of the charges related to this contract were attributed to uh, a reduction in the Park Police budget for 2020. I might look to Director Wiseman to confirm that, but be, but before I do, the this thirty thousand dollar increase is related to services directly around the directly around the litigation, the settlement. If With, I understand. Uh, President Cogill, Commissioner Board, I just want to separate out the work with the four juveniles versus the work around the arbitration with the police officer. This is this is that, if not the part of it that was working with the board juveniles. Okay. Um, I, I think I might just move in. The the thirty thousand dollars is direct a direct result of the arbitration with the police officer that appealed the um, the disciplinary action. President Cogill, Commissioner Horton, that is correct. Okay. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Um, Thank you, Deputy Superintendent. I don't need a response from Director Wiseman, but but I would move to amend the res uh, a resolution 2020-128 to read as follows. I would move to amend it to state that it's a resolution amending professional service agreement uh, number C42558 with Littler Mendelson PC related to the legal fees in the amount of $30,000 for a new contract total of $190,000 and amending the Minneapolis Park and Recreation Board's 2020 approved budget, creating a one-time transfer of $30,000 from the Minneapolis Park Police operating cost budget line item to the superintendent's office uh, operating cost line item to cover the associated increase uh, increases in the Littler Mendelssohn PC contract, resulting from improper interaction between the Minneapolis Park Police and youth at Minnehaha Falls Regional Park. <coughs> The res uh, Commissioner Bourne has provided a uh, amended resolution. Is there a second? Second. The uh, amendment has been moved and seconded. Is there any discussion? Commissioner Meyer. I'd just like to request clarification from the author of the amendment. It goes to the superintendent's budget, but not any specific part in, in the superintendent's budget. Is that correct? Commissioner Bourne. Uh, th thank you, President Cogill. Uh, <laughs> Commissioner Meyer, the um, the intent of the motion is uh, litigation and arbitration costs come out of the superintendent's operating operating line item in, in that department's budget. So it is a one to one dollar transfer to uh, to to represent the increased costs in that line item. <coughs> My second question is for staff. Is there anything time sensitive about this resolution for tonight? Uh, Deputy Superintendent Ringel, or Secretary uh, Ringel. Uh, President Cogill, Commissioner Meyer, the, the, the piece that's time sensitive about this is these were charges incurred in 2019 and we're trying to close out all of our 2019 invoices. So um, again, I would look to Director Wiseman if she feels it could sit over another two weeks. Um, she'd be the one I would, I would be asking that question of. Director Wiseman. Commissioners, President Cogill, um, Commissioner Meyer, uh, the 2019 books actually close this coming Friday um, and processing the amendment will take some time anyway, so um, if this was delayed two weeks, it, it would not impact um, our closing of the books. Thank you. Commissioner Meyer, do you have any other questions? Okay, so if it won't impact that then 
I mean, I am open to considering uh, Commissioner Boren's request. I just want to make sure that it doesn't have any unintended consequences if, if we did that. Um, I don't want to vote for something like that on the spot, um, but would be willing to consider that at the February 19th meeting. So I will uh, vote against the amendment at this time, but would be open to uh, tabling the issue until then. Thank you, Commissioner Meyer. Commissioner French. Uh, uh, Commissioner French has passed. Uh, seeing no other uh, comments, Commissioner Boyne, did you have another No, comment? I would just request a roll. Okay. Uh, we are voting on the resolution 2020-128 as amended by Commissioner Bourne. Commissioner Bourne, would you perhaps state again the amendment for everybody's clarity of knowledge? Uh, yes, the resolution would be amended as follows. A resolution amending professional service agreement, continuing with the remainder of the language as stated. Um, through the um, through the words new contract total of one hundred ninety thousand uh, dollars, erasing the um, erasing the period, and continuing the sentence and amending the Minneapolis Park and Recreation Board's twenty twenty approved budget, creating a one time transfer of thirty thousand dollars from the Minneapolis Park Police operating cost budget line item to the superintendent's office operating cost line item to cover the associated increases in the littler Mendelssohn PC contract resulting from improper interaction between the Minneapolis Park Police and youth at Minnehaha Falls Regional Park. Thank you uh, for the clarification, Commissioner Warren. Um, seeing no other lights being on, uh, would the secretary please call the roll? Commissioner Warren. Aye. Commissioner Musich. Commissioner Severson? Aye. Commissioner Meyer? No. Commissioner Hassan? Aye. Commissioner French? Aye. Commissioner Forney? No. Commissioner Kogia? Aye. You have five ayes, three nays, one absent. The resolution as amended uh, carries. Um, Moving on to report. Didn't we just, just amend it? Now you have no, to vote. Just on the resolution. Amendment. My apologies. Uh, now we will vote on the entire resolution with the amendment. Um, and I'll have the secretary again call the roll. Commissioner Bourne. Aye. Commissioner Musich. Pass. <clears throat> Commissioner Severson. Aye. Commissioner Meyer. Aye. Commissioner Hassan? Aye. Commissioner French? Pass. Commissioner Forney? No. President Kogia? Aye. Commissioner Musich? Aye. Commissioner French? Aye. You have seven ayes, one nay, one absent. Thank you, Secretary Ringgold. The resolution now does carry. We're going to be moving into reports of standing committees. On um, behalf of the Administration and Finance uh, Committee, I would like to move resolution 2020-113, first reading of resolution amending Chapter 15 of the Minneapolis Park and Recreation Board Code of Ordinances relating to parkland dedication to address federal rule updates related to affordable housing. The resolution has been moved. Is there a second? Second. The resolution has been moved and seconded. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, all it, okay. oh. <laughs> I, I apologize. No, My apologies. Oh, okay. Uh, right. Uh, Chair Forney. Okay, I will move resolution 2020-114, a resolution accepting capital improvement grant award from the Mississippi Watershed Management Organization in the amount up to $50,000 for construction of shoreline enhancements focusing on slope stabilization through bioengineering techniques on the Mississippi River Bank of 26th Avenue North Overlook and shoreline enhancement project. The resolution has been moved. Is there a second? Second. 
The resolution has been moved and seconded. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor of resolution 2020-114, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, abstentions? <coughs> uh, the resolution carries. I'd like to move resolution 2020-116, resolution directing the president of the board to negotiate terms of a lease agreement with Superintendent Alfred Bangora, leasing the Theater Worth Home and Administration Center located at 3954 Bryant Avenue South and within Lindale Farmstead Park and to deliver a recommended lease to the Board of Commissioners at its regular meeting on February 19, 2020. The resolution has been moved. Is there a second? Second. The resolution has been moved and seconded. <clears throat> Is there any discussion? Commissioner Bourne. Thank you, President Cogill. I'm going to use this one. <laughs> uh, thank you, President Cogill. Um, the, as I mentioned at our last meeting, I'm certainly uh, supportive of the superintendent and excited that the superintendent uh, is interested in living in the house in a full-time capacity. And I, when we negotiated his temporary living arrangement, there was some question as to whether or not um, he and his family were, were going to look for another home. And I don't think that there is a better place for the uh, superintendent of the Minneapolis Park Board to live than in the superintendent's home. Um, there are, um, I think that there are some pieces to reconcile and some value statement and some values to, to reconcile around um, around how to move forward with this. I think that there are also, I, I find, found myself agreeing with some of the comments from members of the NAACP as well as some of the uh, members from the uh, legacy society. I, I think you have two groups of good people trying to advance the public good and there's um, just some questions around how to best do that. Um, the, the one, we're, we're living in history in a couple of different ways. Obviously the superintendent's residency in the home is incredibly historic. Um, we also have an incredibly historic opportunity with the historical archives of the home and having um, a group of folks that are uniquely qualified in the country, if not the world, to preserve the legacy and, and heritage of that home. Uh, and I would have to think that there would be some way that um, the home can continue to be open to the public as it has been for generations in one form or another um, and still serve as a residency for the, for the superintendent. Um, I, I know Commissioner French and I think Commissioner Vita had also said that it would be incredibly phenomenal for the superintendent to live in the home for free. Um, I agree with that sentiment as well. I think there's a, the, the only question comes to what is the value of living in that, in that home for free and making sure the, if we're only charging around $1,500 a month, that few thousand dollars isn't going to make or break the Minneapolis Park Board. Um, so I would certainly be willing to consider um, a, um, allowing the superintendent to reside in the home free of charge uh, and would ask the super and would ask the president to consider that in his negotiations. The one piece that I would ask in return with that is that we just make sure that we have a real value of the home. Um, and and then that does become a property, or a, I'm sorry, an income tax implication for uh, for the superintendent. I think the superintendent will still come out ahead on that. Um, but we're living in history. I think it's wonderful that the superintendent wants to live in the home. I, I would also ask that the uh, that the president would also um, work with staff to. Uh, to negotiate some sort of permit that keeps the home open to, pu open to the public, whether it's just the drafting room, which there's an incredible amount of history around our park system involved there. Um, the, the temporary permit that the Legacy Society was operating under was created when there wasn't a superintendent living in the home and then under the, and then under the idea that a superintendent would be living there temporarily. So it the operating agreement or the permit that the Legacy Society has now is pretty incompatible with the superintendent living in the house full time and occupying the full house. But but there's got to be a way to 
not lose this incredible piece of history. Um, and if we lose that incredible piece of history now, I don't see the park board ever getting that history back. Uh, there is an incredible wealth of archival information that is owned by the Parks Legacy Society, uh, that is not owned by the Park Board, that would be an incredible loss to the City of Minneapolis if the Legacy Society were forced to auction that off, donate it to other organizations that are not the Minneapolis Park Board. Um, so that would be that would be my guidance in a, ser in a series of negotiations. One of the missteps that I think I took when I was president in, in negotiating the lease and having staff work with the uh, Legacy Society on permit is, in, in the most respectful way, it, it was placing staff in an, in an incredibly difficult position and conflict of interest. The, if the superintendent wants to live in the home, staff report to the superintendent, but they're charged with working with the Legacy Society. It puts everyone in a bad position, and I think that this should be one unique permit that is negotiated by the president of the board. Um, it's my understanding that the president is, already has a meeting tentatively scheduled with the Legacy Society to begin with. Um, I think that there's just a way to celebrate the history that we are living in right now and preserving the last 134 year history of the Minneapolis Park Board. Thank you, Commissioner Bourne. Commissioner French. Uh, I guess I have a, a question to our resident historian, uh, Councillor Rice. Um, would you say it would, has been in the past a right for the superintendent to live in, in that house? Like it's that's something that traditionally the superintendent has had a, a right to do. Um, Mr. President, uh, Commissioner French, and knowing that uh, um, Ms. Mace and others from the Legacy Society are here, what I can say about my experience is that the board, um, David Fisher lived there, uh, had an arrangement to live there. Um, he moved out um, in the late 90s when Mary Merrill Anderson uh, came to be superintendent. She did not have uh, much of an interest in being in the uh, superintendent's uh, residence. There was a debate uh, on the board about what to do about the facility. It was rented out to a couple entities. Um, Commissioner Annie Young always felt that uh, the superintendent should move into the building. Uh, superintendent Gerben did not have an interest in being in the building and it was at one point rented by the uh, uh, Minnesota Park and Recreation Association. Um, and then when uh, Superintendent Miller came to the organization again, <laughs> superintendent or uh, Commissioner Young was very interested in having a superintendent in the building and uh, Superintendent Miller was interested in occupying the residence and that re-established a, a presence for the superintendent to be in the building. Um, I want to be careful about speaking what happened before my time on the board. Um, be, I, I, there are other arrangements, but to my knowledge, um, other superintendents, it's certainly part integral to uh, Theodore Wirth taking the job and his life being in the building. and. Um, I think that uh, I would say since Superintendent Miller moved back into the facility, uh, uh, Commissioner Young's uh, fervent wish was realized and uh, continued when uh, Superintendent Bangora agreed to stay in the building, at least on a temporary basis, and now he's expressed an interest in residing there on a permanent basis. I have a hard time finding uh, that there was a time ever that you weren't on the you know, with the board. <laughs> so I don't know what that. Uh, so, and the reason I reason I bring this up is because, you know, I you may not be legally be able to say it was a right for the superintendent to live in the house, but we can assume to say, hey, this is a place where the superintendent of Minneapolis lived at. And more often than that, in our society, um, rights aren't rights if they can be taken away from you. So if all the superintendent prior had the right to live in that house, either through consensus or tradition or whatever, all of a sudden it's not a right anymore. It's a, it's, it's a privilege. 
when you take right when you can take a right away, when you can take the ability for something to happen, when it's usually always happened that way, then it becomes a privilege. And I have an extreme affinity for wanting the first black family to live in that house, to have an opportunity to live in that house like any other family, undisturbed. And I have the utmost um, affinity for history. I love history. And I think it's really important that we, uh, that we maintain our history and pass it on to the next generations. But I also want to respect the fact that we are in a, a period of history right now. We have a black family living in that house. I don't think there's ever been a time that a black family is living in that house. And we need to celebrate that. We need to put that. Joe needs to have that in some archive or some, you know, diorama or something to say Alvin Gore was the first, and his family were the first black family living in that house. We need to celebrate that. And we need to think about when we tell folks who don't normally look like us that all of a sudden things have to change because now you're in there. We don't know if that's the reason why you want it to change. Because when I wake up every day, most black folks, we wake up, hey, I'm black. White folks don't think that. They wake up and, hey, I'm a teacher. Hey, I'm a, uh, I'm a lawyer. And that, that's, that's what they go through. John, I'm an historian, right? So I think it's something really, really, really special that Alvin Girl wants to live in that house. And I want to make sure that the next black superintendent has a right to live in that house and not the privilege. Just like every other superintendent, who, who the ones who did live in the house chose not to live in that house. I think his, our superintendent is choosing to live in a house. I think is remarkable. He, can, he, he makes enough money we can live in the suburbs. And usually people who make that amount of money, they do. They go live in the suburbs. So it's wonderful that our superintendent lives in our city. He can see the kids that are playing every day in the park that he lives in. I think it's special. And I want it to continue. And if there's some way we can carve out some time and some space for folks to come in and, and see the history of that place, I think that's, I think that's doable. But I, I don't want to change things all of a sudden because there's now there's a black man in a position that he's ne that's never been there before. And so, and that's all I need to say about that. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner French. Thank you, Commissioner Fokil. Thank you, Commissioner French, for how you frame that. I think that is hitting the nail on the head. Um, I've spoken very often about quiet enjoyment. I cannot express to you how unique that is in this world. In China, there is no such thing as private property rights. And private property rights doesn't necessarily mean that you own the property. I believe that half of the commissioners sitting up here are renters. You also have that right of quiet enjoyment. And that really is what we're talking about. It's so unfortunate that you know it's getting mingled or whatever we they with the Lega Soci Society's um, efforts that they've been doing for the past year or so. I don't have my history book in front of me, but there is one um, superintendent that was denied living in the um, Worth House. And it was a political football. And it was because of the fact that um, the public did feel as if this is a public space. It's owned by the taxpayers, et cetera. I don't remember how long it was, but it was approximately two years that the board reversed that decision and allowed that commissioner, uh, excuse me, superintendent to live in the property. So this is not, you know, an, uh, a new conversation that we're having. Um, like I say, to me, it's just so unfortunate that it's this we, they, about the legacy society and their tours versus um, giving quiet enjoyment to our superintendent. Um, I want our superintendent and his family to have quiet enjoyment. As far as the tours, that's a totally different discussion. I'm sorry, that's the way I feel about it. And I hope that we can support that, but I leave that in the hands of our um, president and look forward to us voting on it at our next meeting. Thank you, Commissioner Forney. 
seeing no other <coughs> lights. I uh, greatly appreciate uh, all the words that have been spoken, uh, the testimony tonight uh, regarding the superintendent's house and um, uh, Commissioner Forney's comments, Commissioner Bourne's comments, uh, and especially, uh, I think, Commissioner French's comments. Um, we are living at a point in history, I think I said this last time, and, and the question to me is, whose history are we telling? Um, and, and I think that we can create space to have many different kinds of history being told, and right now we are living in that history, um, and I intend for whatever leads to come forward for board's consideration on uh, February the 19th to reflect um, that reality, that we have more than one history and that we are living right now in a new kind of really remarkable history. Um, that uh, being said, seeing no other comments, all those in favor of resolution 2020-116, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed, abstentions, that carries. I'd like to move resolution 2020-117, resolution approving lease agreement with Peregrine Global LLC leasing commercial space at 3101 Pacific Street North, Unit 200D, located within Above the Falls Regional Park for a one-year term, commencing February 15, 2020. The resolution has been moved. Is there a second? Second. Resolution has been moved and seconded. All those in favor of resolution 2020. Oh, are there any? You have to take a roll. Okay. Thank you, Commissioner Bourne. Uh, I will the secretary please call the roll. <coughs> Commissioner Bourne. I'll pass. Commissioner Musich. Aye. Commissioner Severson. Aye. Commissioner Meyer. Aye. Commissioner Hassan. Yes. Commissioner French. Aye. Commissioner Forney. Aye. President Cogill. Pass. President, or sorry, Commissioner Bourne. Aye. President Cogill. Aye. You have eight ayes, one absent. That resolution carries. Um, I'd like to pass. Uh, Move resolution 2020 118, resolution approving lease agreement with Take Action Minnesota Education Fund leasing commercial space at 1828 Marshall Street Northeast, suite number 14A, located within the Above the Falls Regional Park for a term of one year, <coughs> effective February 15, 2020. Second. I would. The resolution has been moved and seconded. Commissioner French. I would like to accuse myself from this vote uh, as a member of Take Action Minnesota. <coughs> so I would like to. Thank you, Commissioner French. Commissioner uh, Meyer. Thank you. I just wanted to take a minute to celebrate this one and to thank staff for their ingenuity on it, especially uh, to accommodate the needs for people with disabilities and um, make it so that Take Action could use this building. Uh, secondly, I also requested from Council just guidance about um, recusals on this one. If, if a membership with an organization is um, you know, big enough reason to be recusing oneself from it. I mean, I've, been, I've previously, you know, made the membership donation to this organization, but haven't this year. But um, just wanted guidance on uh, conflicts there. Uh, Mr. President, uh, Commissioner Meyer, I, I don't think that membership in an organization, a nonprofit organization, would constitute a financial interest. I have discussed this matter with uh, Commissioner French. I think he feels, given that he's a member on the board of directors and the lease agreement is between this board and that board that he, um, well, I don't think he has any personal financial interest. I think he's, uh, I don't want to speak for him, but I think he thought the perception was an issue and I think he made the right decision, but I don't think a membership in an organization would preclude you from voting on this. Okay, thank you. Uh, Commissioner Frank. I just want to respond to Commissioner yeah. uh, Meyer. Uh, I am exercising an abundance of caution Right? And I just want to make sure that no one could uh, perceive my vote for this as some type of favoritism or anything like that. So right. I think if there's, I'm pretty sure there's enough votes for it to pass, and if not, it's uh, okay. <laughs> Thank you. Understood. Thank you, Commissioner uh, French. Seeing no other comments, um, I will ask the secretary to take the roll. Commissioner Bourne. Aye. Commissioner Musich. Aye. Commissioner Severson. Aye. Commissioner Meyer. Aye. Commissioner Hassan. Yes. Commissioner Forney. Aye. President Kogan. Aye. 
Commissioner Hassan. Aye. You have seven ayes, one absent, and one is recused. Thank you. That resolution carries. Uh, I'd like to move resolution 2020-119, a resolution approving second extension of the lease agreement with St. Anthony Real Estate Company for 30, 31st Avenue North, Unit 300, located within Above the Falls Regional Park through November 30th, 2020. The resolution has been moved. Is there a second? Second. The resolution has been moved and seconded. Um, is there any discussion? Seeing none. Will the secretary please call the roll? Commissioner Board. Aye. Commissioner Musich. Aye. Commissioner Severson. Aye. Commissioner Myers. Aye. Commissioner Hassan. Aye. Commissioner French. Aye. Commissioner Forney. Aye. President Kogan. Aye. You have eight ayes, one absent. Resolution 29. 20-119 carries. Chair Forney. I don't have the language for 129. Do you uh, want I would move it? resolution 2020-120 uh, if it's all right with Chair Forney, a resolution approving an amendment to the refractory concession agreement dated January 4th, 2014 oh, with Sea Salt Eatery LLC for the Minnehaha Park concession, re uh, reducing percentage paid to the NPRB by 1% from 12% to 11% of a gross revenue derived from operations of the facility for a period of July, July 2019 through the end of the 2019 operating season. January 1st. For a period of July 2019 through the end of the 2019 operating season is the resolution that was passed from the committee. The resolution. You said fourth here when it was. Oh, here. excuse me. The resolution has been moved. Uh, and clarified, and uh, is there a second? Second. The resolution has, been, resolution has been moved and seconded. Is there any discussion, Commissioner Frank? Yeah, I guess I got a question. I'm curious about the 1% res uh, reduction. Is there a rationale behind it? Uh, um, we, I might have been told this before, and I just forgot. Yeah. Uh, Director, Mr. Senzel. French. Yes, the, uh, this past summer we had uh, a lapse in cleaning the drain and it backed up sewage and uh, caused them to close for an extended period of time. We lost about $100,000 with the revenue. So this was a settlement with 1%, which came up to about $20,000. Thank you. Now I do remember this incident. <laughs> so thank you for uh, reliving it. <laughs> Thank you, Commissioner French. Uh, seeing no other, sorry about that. Seeing no other uh, questions, uh, all those, uh, see, all those in favor of Resolution 2020-120, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? <coughs> Abstentions? That resolution carries. Uh, moving into unfinished business, uh, we have a discussion item. Uh, the history on ownership and operations of the commons, background on the January permit degree in Minneapolis, and uh, the future of the commons. Um, we have a few folks uh, to talk through this, uh, Council Rice, um, uh, and I, I maybe we'll start with Council Rice uh, to give us a bit of uh, an update. Um, I just want to state quickly to remind commissioners that the reason for this discussion um, is a fewfold. One, uh, to understand uh, how we got to the place of having an uh, independent operator um, and uh, in Green Minneapolis um, uh, taking care of um, that space um, and how we are going to be moving forward now that the, um, that the legal uh, case has been settled after a uh, appeal um, with our uh, own um, uh, union staff um, working in that space. Um, commissioners might also remember that we voted on uh, an extension uh, to that um, uh, agreement and uh, with that ending in the end of March and we want to be sure that um, is on the same page with uh, what they want to see in that space uh, at that time. 
So uh, with that, uh, I will turn it over to Council Rice to start with the, the history. Uh, th thank you, Mr. Uh, uh, President, and I'll uh, attempt to be brief on this history, um, but uh, this is the best way to look at it is go back to 2012 when the legislature authorized, passed a bill authorizing the building of a stadium in downtown Minneapolis to replace the Metrodome. Um, that law did several things. It created the uh, a new Metro Minnesota Sports Facility Authority, um, which would own and operate the new stadium. Um, in addition, the entire project included a significant investment in what is now known as the uh, downtown east neighborhood um, that was uh, intended to not only build a new stadium, but to revitalize that uh, um, part of town. Um, in October of 2013, the Minnesota Vikings entered into a stadium use agreement uh, with the Minnesota Sports Facility uh, Authority and um, that provided that the Sports Facility Authority would enter into a park use agreement uh, for the park and provided in pertinent part that the Minnesota Vikings shall be a third party beneficiary of the park use agreement and that the MS, MFSA shall have certain real estate interests specified in the park use agreement that would run with the land and that those uh, rights were essential to the stadium use agreement. Um, so in essence, that where there was a commitment made in that uh, early agreement about the presence of a park and the rights of the Vikings in the Sports Facility Authority to have some interest in that park. Ryan Construction Company was selected as the general contractor for the project. The project that Ryan entered into a term sheet with the Minnesota Sports Facility Authority, which required that a park use agreement for the future park be negotiated with the city, provided among other provisions that the sports facility had exclusive uh, use of the easterly block of the park for up to 40 days per year for MSFA events, and the Vikings had exclusive use for the entire park on home games for up to 10 additional days each year. Uh, by the time the term sheet was finalized, Ryan had fully executed a purchase agreement with the Star Tribune, which owned the property on which the project would be built. On December 13, 2013, the City Council held a public hearing and then adopted the term sheet and proposed to issue $65 million in bonds for the project. On December 11th of 2013, three citizens, including Paul Ostro, sued the city to halt the issuance of the bond for the construction of the park. The plaintiffs, that was Mr. Ostro, two other uh, plaintiffs, moved to add the NPRB as a necessary party, arguing that the NPRB had exclusive control over the parks in the city and the NPRB had not been included in the negotiations over the term sheet. The district court in that case ultimately held that pursuant to the city charter, the MPRB had the exclusive right to own parks in Minneapolis. The court further ruled that the suit was premature because the MPRB and city had agreed to work collaboratively on the plans for the park. Ryan Construction bought the land, um, and basically in that suit, um, the uh, plaintiffs, Mr. Astor, was not allowed to intervene to stop the issuance of the bonds. Um, Ryan Construction then went ahead and bought the land that had been owned by the Star Tribune to construct the park the, and other property. Um, there was a five block uh, set of properties around the uh, stadium to the either north or east, depending on how you look at a map. The park, now known as the Commons, would be bounded by 4th Street to the north, 5th Street to the south, 5th Avenue to the west, and Park Avenue to the east. Portland Avenue uh, would run through the park, dividing it into a westerly block, um, which would be designed as a traditional park, focusing on recreation, and an easterly block of the park, which would be designed to focus on entertainment and event purposes. The MPRB thereafter participated in discussions over the Urban Park Use Agreement with the City, Ryan, and the Sports Facility Commission and the Vikings. However, the MSFA and the Vikings insisted the terms, uh, terms to the use as set forth in the Stadium Use Agreement and the term sheet be in the Urban Park Use Agreement. Ultimately, Ryan, as owner of the property, agreed and on February 10, 2014, entered into an agreement with the Sports Facility Authority, which provided in pertinent part, the sports facility would have exclusive use 
of the Easterly Block of the Commons for, uh, for free for up to 40 calendar days per year. The Vikings would have exclusive use of both blocks of the Common for free for all home games up to 16 days per year and up to 10 additional days per calendar year for a total of 26 days of free use per year. Both the Sports Facilities Authority and the Vikings would have priority scheduling of the Commons for any event scheduled more than four months prior to the requested events and in events of the stadium uh, and in the event the stadium was selected to host the Super Bowl, the Commons would be deemed exclusively booked by the NFL for whomever the NFL determined was sufficient. Other events were, uh, that were booked outside of the dates um, booked by the Vikings or the MSFA could be bumped by either. And during the times that either the Sports Facility Authority or Vikings were using the Commons, they would have exclusive control over all concessions and merchandising. Um, what's key to this is that entire um, arrangement was then um, put into a covenant that runs with the land. And the agreement state that the use rights described that I've been describing and other covenants, restrictions, agreements, and provisions of the agreement run with the land to the urban park, burden the urban park, and are binding upon the owner and any person or entity holding any right, title, or interest in the urban park. The use rights described in Section 2 and other covenants, restrictions, agreement, and provisions of this agreement are pertinent to the stadium property and inure to the benefit of and may be enforced by the Sports Facility Authority and the Vikings. That urban park use agreement was then recorded with Hennepin County on February 12, 2014. Um, after significant analysis of the effects and these restrictive covenants would have on the Park Board's financial authority to maintain the commons, as well as to the financial sustainability of the rest of the park system, on August 6, 2014, the then Minneapolis Park Board of Commissioners voted not to be involved with, in the development, maintenance, or operation of the commons. Thereafter, the city and the park board entered into negotiations over the operations and maintenance of the common, which was set to open in June of 2016. The end result was that the city purchased uh, the commons from Ryan in 2016. Then the city sold the commons to the park board for one dollar uh, at almost the same time, and then the park board leased that property, the commons property, back to uh, the city for operation and maintenance. Um, that was a matter that the board considered. The board said, hey, we don't want to operate this park, but under the terms of the ju judge, Dickstein was the judge in the original uh, Ostro action. Um, we determined, he ruled that the park board had to own the property, and he left it to the park board in the city to determine how to operate it. Um, we, that transaction was uh, worked out. The park board became the owner of the park, Commons. The park board leased it back to the city for a term of con concurrent with the stadium agreement, which I think is 40 years or 50 years. Is it 30 and 20 or 20? I think it's 30 and 20, 50 years. Um, and um, the city of Minneapolis then entered into a series of agreements with Green Minneapolis to be the operator of the park uh, in 2017, 18, and 19. That operation agreement ended on December 31, 2019. So the city then leased it back from the park board but turned the operations over to Green Minneapolis. Um, in 2017, um, Paul Ostro and John Hayden filed a suit in Hennepin County District Court against the city the Park Board, the Sports Facility Authority, and the Vikings, alleging the lease between the Park Board and the city was illegal because the, char the charter required the Park Board to operate and maintain parks in the city. Um, they also alleged that the urban use agreement was illegal because it granted the Sports Facility Authority and the Vikings free use of a publicly owned park. Finally, they alleged that the city lacked authority to expend taxpayers' dollars to fund the operation and maintenance of the commons. As to the Vikings and the Sports Facility Authority, the District Court held that Hayden and the Ostro lacked standing to seek to invalidate the Urban Park Use Agreement. As, and so the uh, attempt by uh, Mr. Ostro and Mr. Hayden to basically rewrite through their court case the agreement 
that uh, the Urban Park Use Agreement and the Vikings' access to the Urban Park and the sports facility, the court basically said, you have no standing to challenge that agreement. The court did, um, and the, the court did, um, did go on to say, though, in the, as to the other part of the Ostro Hayden Law suit, that the city was precluded from entering into the lease and operating agreement because the charter reserved the right to operate and maintain parks to the park board, um, even if the park board approved that arrangement. The district court issued an injunction that took effect on May 1, 2019, precluding the city from continuing to operate and maintain the commons under the lease. Um, so in essence, Judge Peterson, who handled the second case, said under the charter, as he reads it, the park board has to own the park and operate the park. The city can't have any role uh, in leasing it or in operating it. There was a, uh, at that point on May of last year, and um, at this point, this park board was involved in order to maintain the status quo during the pendency of the appeal but to comply with the court's injunction, the city subleased the commons back to the park board. Um, the park board also assigned the operating agreement that they had with Green Minneapolis to the park board. And the effect of this assignment was that the park board took over as the party to that operating agreement, uh, along with the city's uh, rights and obligation under the agreement um, with uh, Green Minneapolis. Um, in January of uh, just last month, on January 21st, the Court of Appeals upheld the District Court decision in joining the city from operating and maintaining the commons. Um, there's a period of time which the board could appeal that. We haven't heard from the city. I mean, the city would have to appeal by February 20th. We haven't heard from the city as whether they're interested in doing it. Um, and um, But at this point, if there's no appeal, and, the, and given the Court of Appeals decision, the injunction that was there, um, the park belongs to the park board. Um, the lease and sublease back between the city and the park board is void. Um, the park is now the park board's park um, at this point, and uh, it's the board's responsibility to decide uh, how to operate that. Also. Uh, at the board meeting in January, um, the board, uh, the 22nd meeting, uh, that was the day after the court decision, uh, the board uh, passed the operating agreement, to continue the operating agreement with Green Minneapolis through uh, March 31st. Um, and um, so that's the, uh, that's the, the, um, Situation there. A couple questions have come up about one. They raised the issue about whether those deed restrictions, the covenant runs with the land about the stadium uh, sports facility authority having access to those days and the Vikings having access. It was our opinion that that is a valid, uh, um, as, a, uh, uh, as those restrictions say, it burdens the land. We also checked with uh, Malkerson, Gunn, and Martin. They're a firm that we use to work on real estate matters. We received an opinion from Greg Soule that, uh, in his opinion, he's a real estate lawyer, that uh, the park board owns the land, but you're subject to those urban park use agreements, which allow the sports facility authority uh, access to the park on certain days and the Vikings, and the board is under an obligation, since you own the land, to maintain the park to um, urban park standards, whatever the standards that the board has. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Council Rice. Uh, before we have questions, um, I'm wondering if it would be helpful to additionally have a quick overview of what the plan is for transitioning to the park staff, our, our park staff, in maintaining that space given the urban parks use agreement and, and what action staff is, has taken um, in moving in that direction. Assistant Superintendent Barrick. Good evening, President Colville, Commissioners. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Let me quick pull up a brief presentation and I'll have uh, Deputy Superintendent Ringgold join me um, as well as Shane Stenslin regarding 
uh, the overall operation of the commons as we see it and as we're currently working through it. Um, so if I can get that up. So just a quick graphic of uh, Council Rice, an outline of where the, the park lies and how it's bisected by Portland. And there's two different. Um, I can't see it up there. I'm a visual person, so I'm kind of helping. <laughs> oh, great. Here you go. All right. Okay, great. All right. So this is a graphic of the park, um, a schematic that kind of illustrates all the features. And you can see how Portland runs between the two. And on the, on the left, you have that traditional park setting with uh, some play mounds, different pavement surfaces, some natural areas, some gardens. And then on the parcel on the right, um, that's more of that public space. It's a kind of an open lawn area. Uh, there is a playground feature, there is a spray feature, uh, and then an alley of trees, um, and again, some different uh, surfaces. So, uh, at the end, there's a lot of different activity that happens in this park. I don't think anything individually is unique to what happens in other parks, but I think what makes this as unique is it's kind of a collection of all these things in one space where we don't have a building or a facility um, to support um, all of these activities. So, um, we like to break it down into, there's three different ways to think about operating the commons. There's the maintenance component of it, there's the security component, and then there's the programming. And so I'll cover the maintenance, and then I'll ask uh, Deputy Superintendent Ringgold to cover the security on behalf of Chief Ohado, and then Shane Stenson to talk about the programming. And uh, what we want to do is break things down just so that we can make you aware of the things that we need to be considering as we move forward with how we're going to manage this. So when we look at the summer maintenance operations, one of the first things we notice is that the turf is remarkable down there. Um, it's a really nice aesthetic that's probably equal, if not greater, than some of the turf at our premier fields. And so questions around that aesthetic and, again, pesticides or fertilization, what are we willing to do there? There is irrigation. Um, but uh, that's something to think about. It's a heavy use um, area as well, so that it's almost like a golf course turf in the middle of the city. Um, then when we look at like the sweeping and blowing and washing of debris, again, some of these different pavement surfaces have different requirements, so it's not a, just a basic asphalt and we can use kind of the regular brooms and brushes. Um, so we have to take those things into consideration. Litter uh, being picked up right now, Green Minneapolis has been staffing the park 6 a.m. to 10 p.m with uh, people picking litter, essentially. And so for us, our operations are typically 6 a.m. to 2.30. In the summer, we do have an evening shift that runs to about 9, but it's a very much skeleton crew. Um, graffiti removal, we know it's a dense populated urban area. There's the plant and shrub garden maintenance. Again, that's nothing beyond. Um, and then through the everything else, irrigation, we have irrigation with the sculpture garden. Lighting maintenance and repair, that's nothing abnormal. Um, and kind of that whole list there is nothing out of the ordinary. Uh, when we switch to winter, uh, there is snow removal, you know, to be considered around the perimeter and the interior pads are all done. Uh, currently the patios and kind of the open areas are not uh, plowed, just the path is plowed through them. So again, with the surfaces, we have to consider what equipment we would be using. Uh, it's not going to be a traditional plow. Um, a litter is picked up in the winter as well. It's still a popular uh, and well-used park in the winter. And again, the hours of operation for us, 6 a.m. to 2.30, we, that's within our norm. Uh, in the winter, we don't run evening crews. So that 2.30 to 10 p.m. becomes something we have to figure out uh, that's a little bit out of the norm. Uh, everything else, the graffiti and the maintenance of the infrastructure, like bike racks, et cetera, that all, that all remains the same. And so when we think about the operations, the first thing that is, for us is that 6, 6 a.m. to 10 p.m., seven days a week, um, that, that's an expansion from what we traditionally do. Uh, the litter and garbage being picked up from 2.30 to 10. There are portable toilets on site, which we have throughout the system. Uh, these are actually locked from 10 p.m. to 6 a.m., so there's an element of returning to the park at 10 p.m. to lock the portable toilets. Um, and then we have, uh, and Shane will talk a little bit more about this with programming, but there's this patio furniture, library carts, they put out uh, bean bags, ping pong. There's kind of some site infrastructure that they put out during the day. It's free for people to use, but then it's brought back in and secured. There's not a facility on site for to store all of that equipment. So we have to take that into account. When we look at it, we see it as 
uh, essentially with the addition of two park keepers, a full-time gardener, and a crew leader, we could, add, we could basically have a crew assigned to the downtown area and pick this up with a maintenance regime. Um, that also has some equipment implications. We would want a, crew for the, a truck for the crew, a truck for the crew leader, a trailer, the Toro and the Kubota for equipment to be on site or be used at this site, and then miscellaneous small equipment that's you know electric and gas powered. Um, Probably the greatest challenge is just the storage and and uh, storage of that that equipment. <coughs> where would we house the crews? Um, and we think we can figure that out with this approach to a downtown parks crew. Um, and with that, I'll turn it over to Deputy Superintendent Ringel. President Colgill, Commissioners, it's not often I get to present on security, so um, I will do my best uh, to, to walk you through this. The first couple of items is to help you understand the current condition around how security is currently managed within um, the Commons. And so um, Green Minneapolis reports that they provide a significant amount of on-site security with uh, security um, services that they actually secure in addition to the city of Minneapolis police. Their, that service is providing 24-hour, uh, seven-day a week, including that overnight coverage through three overlapping day shifts during the summer. And what uh, they report is that the, that security staff is focusing primarily on ongoing um, issues around livability that they define as alcohol and drug use, camping, and disorderly behavior within the, within the park. Uh, the Minneapolis Police Department, as I mentioned, is the primary police service and on-call response to the park currently. Um, and just to give you a sense of what we are currently doing, what Park Police is currently doing in downtown, is that um, this year, due to the increases in park acquisition, development, and expansion of calls in downtown, they have actually looked at how uh, they're <coughs> allocating resources throughout the system. And this has resulted in um, dedicating one police squad to pat patrol downtown in the Phillips neighborhood from 11 a.m. until 9 p.m. <coughs> This has resulted in some shifts throughout the city, um, and Chief Ohado said the primary impact of that shift is uh, reducing patrols in District 1 in order to make that work. Um, and that the current policing um, uh, level that we have, or the staffing that we have, wouldn't be able to provide that type of overnight security in particular, or dedicated security that um, Green Minneapolis is currently providing within the park. A few kind of uh, overarching considerations that will go into how Chief Ohado would form a budget for this area or think about a budget for this area, which um, would be looking to commissioners to help provide some insights into what your vision would be in some of these cases, is that currently the park is managed under the City of Minneapolis ordinances, which includes some different thinking, in particular around alcohol use. As we would shift toward using park board ordinances within this space, there's likely some um, events that are already booked that are actually booked with the idea of having that previous ordinance structure, so we'd have to work out that component of it. And then we'd also have to be proactive in communicating to future events or reoccurring events that they have in that space that we'd be working under our policies and ordinances now unless there was some interest in changing those. We wouldn't actually recommend having a different set of rules for one park versus another set of parks, so you'd want to look at those things a little bit more holistically. Um, currently, the Minnesota Vikings um, hires off-duty police officers up to five to provide se event security at the Commons for game-related activities. We foresee that this is something that um, may run into issues with our current um, uh, union contract for park police in terms of maybe being viewed as supplanting work that would that they should have first right to. So that would be something that we would need to sort out and think about what that impact would have on um, our current resources. And then finally, and this is uh, one of the areas Shane will um, come together uh, up uh, come up on this in just a little bit is that one of the biggest relationships with folks in 
um, the support services, including our special events and permits area and park police, is around those major events that we provide um, throughout the park system, or <coughs> permit throughout the park system. And you can see here, in talking with Green Minneapolis, in the last two years they had about 150 events and um, programs. That would be already in addition to what we're currently pro providing um, security services for within the Minneapolis park system. So there is an increase in that load and would be an impact then on, as we have tried to pull event, special events across the system into a range that would work with our current capacity, this will be a this will be an immediate increase in that. So we'd have to be looking at how to cover those costs. Um, and with that, I will turn it over to Shane. President Kogel, Commissioners. Um, as far as programming in the Commons goes, currently, as most of you are aware, we've talked about the MOU with the MSFA and the, and the Vikings. I believe I gave a report to the previous board when this first came out. and talked about a lot of the limitations that go with that just in the days that allows for events to come in. Uh, currently, Green Minneapolis is providing programming and permitting in the parks, including, again, the lawn furniture, the library and game carts that uh, um, we talked about, the managed permits, and the, they manage the permitting in the commons. They provide host and self-directed programming, provide limited, uh, especially public, event, uh, public events annually, and then they allow for food trucks to park next to the park, um, but they don't charge for it. So a lot of that trash comes into the park that would, we would have to maintain. So we'd have to look at that. Um, some considerations if we were to operate the park as far as activation, uh, activating the space and um, providing space activation experiences in the park while generating revenue to support the operation of the programming. Uh, first thing that we look at is the food options for sure. Um, whether that would be food trucks and trying to negotiate something with that or kiosks or um, possibly a seasonal operation, but all things that we would have to consider at that location. Uh, we'd look at programming partnerships. Um, we'd obviously work with our current stakeholders, the Minnesota Vikings and MSFA. We've had some preliminary meetings with them. We would continue with those meetings moving forward. Um, and then, of course, our nonprofits that we work with currently in the downtown, Meet Minneapolis, Marketing Minneapolis, uh, maybe some Hennepin County grants, the Armory. Um, we look at programming uh, contracts like we currently do with, again, Hennepin County Theater Trust. We've used them, um, Northern Spark, uh, MIA, those types of things. We would continue with those. Um, I don't know if you've been down there, but there's a lot of branding and marketing that's not ours. And we would look to create some branding and marketing that shows that this is belongs to the Minneapolis Park and Recreation Board. Uh, and of course, always striking a balance between self-directed and active programming. We don't want to love the park too much. And, and quite frankly, um, given where we're at with capacity issues with all of our parks in our system uh, and the resources it takes, um, we're really going to have to balance this with not only the use in this park, but with our do other downtown parks and our park system as a whole. Uh, we currently turn away events because we don't have the resources to um, to, ha to, to handle them in our park system. So keep that in mind that we are turning away events at Lake Nokomis at other locations. So, um, and then of course, then we would do the event permitting. Um, and one thing to keep in mind is, is we would follow our ordinances and our policies and our fee structure when it comes to event permitting. Um, I'm not sure what the fee structure is currently with um, Green Minneapolis, but um, it's, it's fairly comparable. But uh, we just want to make sure that we would follow ours. So, Th and. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, that's helpful. Think, oh, yes. Just kind of close it out to yeah. plant the seed. It would just be that, you know, three options and going forward to thinking it forward you know status quo continue with green minneapolis a complete mprb takeover or the idea that there could be a hybrid based on these considerations some sort of um way forward so to plant that seed and then turn it over to you for insight and direction thank you very much uh to everybody for helping with that presentation uh looks like we have a few folks with comments and questions um and I will begin with Commissioner Bourne. Thank you, President Colville. Um, I think my first question, and it might be a motion, is I requested at our last meeting 
that this board enter into closed session to discuss personnel issues around violation of the law in regards to the permit that was issued for the first part of uh, for the first part of January. Um, it's my intent to make that motion tonight. It's my intent to go into closed session. There are some other uh, items of business that we need to discuss, so I would leave it up to the president's discretion if he would like to hear that motion to enter into closed session now to discuss the violation of uh, the uh, city ordinances, or if you'd like to continue with the ongoing discussion around the future of the park. I want to talk about the future, and I would like to continue to do that uh, okay. since we just had a presentation. Uh, thank you, President Cogill. Um, I, I do have some. I, I, I do have some concerns looking over uh, with our with our potential pathways forward, and just looking at the maybe extreme inefficiency of a partnership with Green Minneapolis after looking over their 990s. It looks like they have approximately a $1.5 million operating budget, 750,000 of that is towards executive expenses. I think two, uh, nearly 200,000 of that is to uh, Steve Kramer, who is not, who is a member of a different organization. So their 990s just get a little tricky. And so when I look at a $1.5 million budget with 750,000 of that going towards executive compensation. I've got to think that this being a publicly subsidized park, the Minneapolis Park and Recreation Board can do it more cost effectively. Um, the, and it's <coughs> just trying to reconcile some of the things that I've, I've heard said, um, some of the, what I think might be bad faith violations of our <coughs> of the jurisdiction clause of our collective bargaining unit. Um, I, I don't think we should even be having this discussion on three pathways forward. It's a Minneapolis park at the termination of the uh, operating agreement with Green Minneapolis. Our collective bargaining unit came into play. And so from public testimony, I heard from members of uh, Layuna 363 in our last couple of meetings. It sounded like there was no, and hearing some confirmation from staff, that there was no uh, communication with our bargaining units uh, to begin operation of the park. Um, and instead, a permit was issued, which I'll, I'll be asking to move into closed session later because that permit was issued in violation of the uh, Minneapolis, uh, the Minneapolis Park Board Code of Ordinances. Um, but just to clarify where we're going moving forward, um, uh, I would have a resolution I'd like to put on the floor right now, uh, just a resolution directing Superintendent Bangora to enter into negotiations with Lyuna 363 and the Minneapolis Police Officers Federation for operations of the, co of the Commons Park effective April 1st. Second. The resolution has been moved and seconded. Is there any discussion on the resolution at this time? Commissioner, well, Commissioner Bourne, do you want to speak at all in addition to the resolution you just made, or did you already um, say I, what I, you needed to? I think I'll wait. I think okay. I'll wait. Uh, Commissioner Musich. Thank you, President Kogel. I guess I'm unclear why we would need to negotiate with our unions to take over this work, where it, wouldn't our existing contracts apply if we were to say we want our staff to maintain this park as if it were any other park in the system. Um, in reading the agreements, we don't specifically call out a list of all 218 properties that we currently are operating. So it, um, if someone could explain that to me, I would appreciate it. I don't know who the appropriate person for that would be, if it's Assistant Superintendent Barrick or Council Rice. Um. If I could just uh, comment, I mean, you have uh, agreements already with both of those entities. As I explained before, this is assuming there's no appeal in the case. This is a Minneapolis park like any other park at this point, subject to the deed restrictions about dates that uh, the sports facility authority and the uh, Vikings get to use the park. But it's a Minneapolis park, so I would see the need for a resolution your park and get to decide how you operate. I, if, if the board does not uh, extend any operating agreement, the agreement with Green Minneapolis lasts through uh, March 31st of this year and expires then. If you don't renew it, then by default it's going to be your, you've got to run the park. 
Right. Thank you for the clarification. So I, I guess I would not be in favor of passing a resolution to renegotiate contracts that already are in place to do this work. I'm not interested in providing um, one park in the city with more services than other parks get. Um, and I don't know if that's the intention to renegotiate to have park police working overnight and um, park keepers working overnight. I, I don't feel like that's a realistic ask um, of our staff. And if we're not doing it for every other park in the system where people live around them, um, I, I don't see that we should be doing that downtown. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Musich. Uh, Commissioner French. <clears throat> I am, I, I have been a union member for about 20 years. And I am in, under no mistake that the, the lifestyle that I live right now and the living that I have is because I was a union member. And those are union jobs. <clears throat> Municipal union jobs. Jobs that people provide for their families with. Jobs that people send their kids off to college with, pay bills. Sustainable, municipal, park jobs. We already have folks in our park system that do the jobs that it's being done at the North Commons right now. I don't understand why we're having people who don't work for us do the same work that we have workers that do right here in our park system. We have a collective, we have a collective bargaining agreement <coughs> with a union already, 360. Uh, I think we need to honor that. I think we need to honor those folks who have committed themselves to working for the Minneapolis Park Board. I think we have to commit to making sure those folks have hours. And uh, I'm pretty sure maybe everybody might not want to work on a weekend, but there may be some folks that will want to get some extra hours. So I, I, I will really be in favor that the Park Board is maintaining that, that area and that space. It's a very valuable space. We didn't really ask for it, but since we got it, I think we should maintain it just like we maintain every other park in our city with every other union that we have made agreements with in the city. And if somehow uh, we have violated one of these agreements, I want to know. I want to know if union jobs, city union jobs, or withheld from other people. It may not mean a lot to people who make $120,000 a year or $100,000 a year, but it means a lot to somebody who makes 40 and 50 or, you know. So, <clears throat> I am not in favor of keeping any type of agreement with a non-city entity. I just, I want that to be known. So, thank you. I have a point of order question. Do we need to be suspending the rules to debate uh, a motion at this time? Since it wasn't on our agenda to consider this motion. Council Rice. <coughs> uh, I, this, as I understand, this is a study and report item matter. Uh, if Commissioner Bourne wants to bring a resolution forward at this point, he could, but it would take a two-thirds vote to add it to the agenda at this point of the meeting. It, wasn't, it was a study and report item at the beginning of the meeting. Okay. So is that a suspension of the rules vote? Essentially. And then an amendment of the agenda vote Basically. that follows? Okay. Um, okay, I see a variety of lights on, but to to that point, uh, I, I think if we are going to continue to debate a resolution that, not sure if it's going to be on the agenda right now or not, um, then I think that we should have that uh, vote on the suspension of the rules uh, first. President Kogel, I have a point of order. Yes. Thank you, President Kogel. It, it's long been the tradition standing of this board over the close to 11 years that I've been on it 
that, um, and given some time, our secretary can find multiple examples of this when an item has been on the board for discussion. Uh, resolutions at that time have always been considered in order and not an amendment to the agenda and not a suspension of the rules. This, uh, this was publicly noticed that we would be having a discussion around this item. A resolution at this time is in order. I would request a ruling from our parliamentarian on that statement. Um, Mr. President, on the point of order, I would respectfully disagree with Commissioner Warren. A, a resolution is an a action of the board, and to, our resolutions are always published in advance or, or added to the agenda at the beginning of the meeting. Okay. Thank you, uh, Parliamentarian Rice. I am going to. Uh, uh, I'm going to uh, agree with our parliamentarian on this item. Um, I will say uh, that uh, I think there is great value in uh, the discussion here, and I would be um, very supportive of an, a resolution to come forward um, at the next meeting that affirmatively states that our uh, Union 363 staff will take over operation of the Queens Park on the 1st of April. Um, I'm not interested in, in the middle of a discussion that is about a variety of issues around our, our Commons Park going into um, a uh, resolution that has just been thrown out there. Um, but that said, there are a variety of comments right now, and I will. Do I still have the floor after clearing the points of order. Do you still have the floor? Yes. He wants to continue speaking. Uh, yes, I suppose you do. Uh, <laughs> thank you, President Cogill. Um, I would make a motion to suspend the rules of the board for the purposes of adding an item to the agenda. Do we? OK. Um, that resolution has been moved. All right, motion. Give me a second. Is there a second to the motion? Second. There is a motion and a second. Is there any discussion? We don't discuss that, I don't think. I no discussion on this uh, motion. All those in favor? I'd ask for a roll call. All right. President Bourne. Perfect. Aye. Sorry, Commissioner Bourne. Aye. Uh, Commissioner Musich. No. Commissioner Severson. Aye. Commissioner Meyer. No. Commissioner Hassan? Aye. Commissioner French? Aye. Commissioner Forney? No. President Kogel? No. You have four ayes, four nays, one absent. Uh, that, resol or that motion does not carry. Uh, moving on with comments on the discussion item. Still have comments. Com 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 okay. Commissioner Bourne, um, Thank can continue uh, with your speech. Th <laughs> Thank you, President Kogel. Um, I don't know how much of a speech it is as so much of a statement of, of fact, but um, I, you know, I, I will say I, I'm really concerned that we're talking about um, three options now. If, if, and if everybody is saying, hey, it's this option, why aren't we taking that vote right now? And the, my concern is, is I've witnessed on uh, this institution through incrementalism by telling our collective bargaining agreements, worry about that next week, nothing's happening now, nothing's happening now. I witnessed the largest outsourcing of public employees in the history of the city of Minneapolis through some of our uh, guests and partners that are, that are here tonight uh, through the outsourcing of our winter operations. I'm not going to stand by and let that same thing happen and say, hey, we're just having conversations. Don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. Hey, let's have this vote for Green Minneapolis. Uh, to the 5th District's concern, Commissioner's concern about why are we taking this vote tonight if our collective bargaining agreement would just go into play, our collective bargaining agreement went into play on January 1st when our operating agreement expired. Uh, at that time, the Commons should have been operated by 363 and the Police Officers Federation. It was not. Um, subsequently, staff told us that they believe that they have the authority under, their, uh, under an ordinance around construction permits 
that they can bring in an army of union busting scabs at any time to stop uh, to stop our union sisters and brothers from working uh, from doing the work that this board approved for them to do. Um, if, if that had not occurred, I, I'd feel a lot more comfortable about the good faith continuation of the conversation. But if we're all up here saying it's the only option we're going to consider is having the Minneapolis Park Board take over operations on April 1st. Why are those other op why are those other options there? I believe the majority of the board has already stated what their position is on this starting on April 1st. And why then is there a concern and a fear around taking that vote now unless our actions unless our words aren't reconciling with our actions? Um, so I hope that this uh, I hope that the president will put this on the uh, on the agenda at the next meeting. It's what the majority of this board has stated that their intentions are. Um, the and this partnership with Green Minneapolis is just a ineffective way uh, use of taxpayer dollars. Um, I, I'm also curious. I, I also agree with the fifth district commissioner that um, I, I think she and I and commissioner. No, that's not true. Um, I think I'm the only member of this board that voted, a, sitting here, that voted against this agreement for the first place because I thought it was a violation of the city charter. Um, and it turns out that it was. Uh, subsequently, I think the 5th District Commissioner and Commissioner Forney and I have agreed that if we take over operation of this park, this isn't our mess. And so the I'm not interested in seeing um, other neighborhood parks suffer because of this. And so I guess my question would be is what conversations either the superintendent or the president of the board have had with the city of Minneapolis and our colleagues in the mayor's office um, around the funding for the operation of this park starting on April 1st. Thank you, President Bourne, uh, or Commissioner Bourne. Um, I'm, I, I guess uh, to the, one question that, that was posed, uh, we intend to have a meeting with the uh, mayor uh, on this subject and it has not happened yet. Um, and I think those concerns are all valid um, regarding the need to have uh, sufficient resources for operation of this park. Um, does the superintendent have anything to add? Okay. Uh, and the, the next thing I, that I'll say is I appreciate Ms. Uh, Commissioner Bourne's concerns about um, having everybody he be heard uh, on the board regarding their position on what should go forward. Um, three, uh, the, the purpose of having this discussion was to have those opinions articulated and uh, I, with all due respect, not everybody has spoken yet on the board and we do have one commissioner who is absent. Um, though I believe that I, uh, she has uh, spoken her opinion on, on this particular item. Um, with that said, I would like to continue to have other commissioners have the opportunity to weigh in on this discussion item, and I will go to Commissioner Forney. Oh, okay, thank you. Um, okay, we're just discussing, it's just a discussion item that we're doing. There's no resolution that's being here and everything, so. Um, so, if I understood, February 20th is when the city can choose to appeal the decision, correct? That's correct. I, uh, the, the, the final date, okay. And, and the park board could as well. Uh, we've advised the city attorney's office that uh, we'd like their advice on what they're doing before we come here. Okay. And since we're having another meeting prior to that, possibly that could be something coming, uh, another board meeting and everything. Yeah, actually, the next board meeting is um, the 20th. It's before the, it's the 19th. 19th. The 19th. That so would the be day the before. last possible day. Right, yes. right. Anyway, okay. So I, I just wanted to get clarity about that. And if I understand also correctly, is that in the city's budget, there is funding for um, the commons. Uh, Mr. President, Commissioner Forney, as I understand that the city of, uh, of Minneapolis at their last meeting of the year set aside 750000 in uh, funds in the convention center budget for the downtown Commons Park. 
Um, the agreement that the board approved in January allocated uh, 175,000, I believe, of that 750 for the first quarter of the year. Thank you. Um, and also for some clarification, um, presently Green Minneapolis is running the park and the workers who maintain that park, I understand, are union workers. That's my, Mr. President, Commissioner Forney, that's my understanding as well. I believe they're members of the uh, SEIU. Okay, all right, so, I mean, I don't want to deny any union members jobs, so knowing that they are a union already, uh, I think that needs to be uh, commented on. Um, I don't want to litigate this, but I, I've just never had any understanding of, okay, I'll just bring it up. Do we do any maintenance of Gold Medal Park? No, uh, Mr. President, Commissioner Farney, no, we do not. And do, does the city own that property? Uh, uh, Mr. President, Commissioner Forney, I believe that half of the park is owned by uh, McGuire. Mr. McGuire, and the other half is owned by the, um, entitled, I believe, by um, by the city, but through the CPAT, I believe, but I'm not, I, I believe the other half is owned by the city in some capacity. That's okay. And, but I'm not familiar how it's operated. Okay, well, and, and I guess, the, you know, my concern is, is that, you know, if, the judges declare that the city cannot operate parks. I've never understood then why gold medal has not been a question. I mean, I think it's important for everybody to know that the, the true nature of this suit really was the, the total agreement around the Vikings stadium and, and it is whatever, an end run of that. So. Um, <coughs> Anyway, I, I looked Mr. it up. President, I think I, how I could add. I think Commissioner Forney, uh, you certainly have a valid opinion in that regard. But I'm not aware of any litigation that's ever uh, been involved with Gold Mountain Park. I am familiar there's litigation with the Commons. Exactly. That's why we're here. Anyway, I guess you know it's just mind blowing to me that you know um, one place it can, another place it can't. Anyway, I can get into other things, but. Um, so last April, um, we, the board, chose to keep Green Minneapolis managing and overseeing this property. Uh, Mr. President, yes, last April, uh, Judge Peterson ruled that the agreement between the, um, that the city could not own a park, own and operate a park in Minneapolis so the city gave up its or subleased it back to the park board so the park board would be the we were always the owner but we were technically back the sub lessee and the operator had to operate the park and what the, this board chose to do was to basically continue the arrangement of having green minneapolis operate that Park. Okay, and I guess the reason why I'm asking it is that, you know, what at least was presented to us is, in essence, three different options. But I don't believe that there were three different options that were presented to us last April of we could take over the management and care, keep it with Green Minneapolis, or what it was, a combination, I think, is what the last thing was. Um, that was not presented to the board as an option, correct? Um, Mr. President, Commissioner Forney, we were still in litigation and uh, we believe that uh, Judge Peterson's uh, decision was not correct, uh, but the Court of Appeals has advised us uh, on January 21st uh, that Judge Peterson was correct. But we, the board, chose to keep with Green Minneapolis. At that time, a year ago. Okay. I mean, to me, I think that's important that we, you know, the board all unanimously, you know, did say we would keep it in here. So being that we don't While know. While the appeal was pending. Right. But the appeal possibly still could be pending at this moment, that, again, through February 20th. If it I, could. Okay. All right. So um, anyway, I, I guess um, 
I don't remember the dates and, you know, when everything happened and everything, but it was a conundrum, you know, um, some years ago about whether or not we should be running that. Um, it was decided that we should not be running it. We're back into this um, conundrum. Um, whether or not it is to be run by Green Minneapolis or whether it's run by us or whether it's a combination and everything, to me, I think is the nature of this discussion. And I, I just want us to keep focus on that. Um, there are a lot of different ways that our properties are being managed. And so I think that we should be open you know, to what those are. Um, and um, to hear that there is 24-7 security um, presently, um, to me, considering there is no other park, as far as I know, in the system that does have that, um, and I believe we just voted to, I think, take $30,000 away from the police, um, park police and everything, to me, I, I just feel like, wow. <laughs> Um, that's a heavy lift that I, I'm not sure that we'll be able to um, to match. Um, and even the, even if it was just our hours, it is a whole huge um, piece of property for us to to um, patrol. So um, I, I'm open to keeping it the way it is. I'm open to you know a combination. Um, I guess to me. Um, we're back to what we were, what was it, seven years ago? Anyway, when the decision, right, is that this is a lift. This is a really, really huge lift. And um, I think we need to weigh it very seriously, look at the numbers of what works best for, um, well, for our system, I think, is, is the most important thing. If we're going to be shortchanging in other areas of the city so that we can take over something that we chose not to take over, um, I think that um, there's some huge implications. So um, that's all I have to say for now, but um, I feel like we're right back to square one and um, with less resources than what we've had before. Thank you, Commissioner Forney. I want to apologize to Apologize to all commissioners for not instating some time limits earlier. We won't have any time limits tonight, but I'm going to start having some time limits. Uh, this is a long discussion. Chris Meyer, you are next. Commissioner. Thank you. Could someone put back the three options on screen for me that were presented earlier? Uh, so just in general, I am going to be pretty hesitant to vote in favor of resolutions that are brought forward you know, during the board meeting when I haven't had uh, the chance to review them, when staff haven't um, gone over them and, and constituents um, haven't had the opportunity to, to give feedback. So even when there are things that I agree with, I'm, I'm gonna, be wanna, gonna wanna be really careful about that just to avoid any unforeseen con consequences from them. Uh, but at the same time, uh, I think the value, in particular, of Commissioner Bourne's uh, proposal, even if it was perhaps redundant because you know, we wouldn't, wouldn't have to necessarily enter into new negotiations, but I would like to just um, give some assurance that I would like to see uh, the Park Board take over uh, the operations of the Commons and um, have our staff uh, operating it. Uh, so, um, I don't want to end debate on this, so I'm not, I will wait until debate is over, but I would, uh, at that point, like to uh, propose to suspend the rules, uh, to put forward a motion to express that the will of the Minneapolis Park and Recreation Board of Commissioners uh, is that staff proceed to uh, prepare to take over the entire operation of the Commons, or option two. Uh, just to give reassurance about where commissioners stand broadly on that issue without uh, putting a date on it um, or, or entering new contracts. Um, I you know, want to have some flex flexibility for staff to be able uh, to address things like um, you know, off-duty police and uh, overnight shifts, but um, after the discussion is over, I would like to put that motion forward. 
Thank you, Commissioner Meyer. Uh, Commissioner French. <clears throat> I just want to talk about the difference between a private sector union job and a, and a government union job. There is a huge difference. My grandma worked for the federal government for 20-something years, and she was able to take care of me and take care of six other kids. There is a difference between uh, when the city employs somebody and goes to work because they make sure that that person, whoever they are, have enough money to actually survive and take care of themselves. I don't know how much the SEIU workers for uh, Green Minneapolis make, but I don't, pretty sure it's not the same we pay our guys. So it's not, it's not the same. It is not. I've been a union member all my life. It's not the same. When you're a member of a union, you can have a discussion with your boss and say, I'm not making enough money to just live off of. That's the difference, especially in municipal unions. There's a lot of difference. You get to determine <clears throat> the people. That, the people of this city get to determine who works for them, and they've determined that this board right here gets to determine, gets to decide who gets to clean up in our parks and maintain our parks. And we've made a decision that woman's the one who gets to do that. Municipal workers. I hope uh, my fellow commissioners could really understand the, 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 the difference between being a non-union member worker and being a union member. It, it is a huge difference. And the difference between being a municipal union worker and a private union worker is a huge difference. And I want you guys to really understand that. We're talking about people's lives here. We're talking about workers that we have already decided that we've already made agreements to say, hey, if we got maintenance costs, we got maintenance issues, you are the ones that can take care of that. If, we, if they're giving us this park that we didn't vote on, that they're not going to give us money to take care of, then we get to decide how, it run, how it's ran. And we're going to run it how we've ran our parks traditionally, using our workers, our people, and the stuff we use. And the issue with the police, just to address that, that was an issue that was caused by the police. We didn't take money out of the police budget because we wanted to be antagonists in the police department. That money was, that money came out of a, a, a settlement and uh, the, the, the court cost for that settlement. I refuse to take money out of the hands of rec centers to pay for a mistake that the police have done. So I, I don't have too much else to say. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner French. Uh, Commissioner Bourne for the second time? I haven't gotten Commi to speak Commissioner yet. Musich, my apologies. Thank you, President. Kogel, uh, <clears throat> as much as I appreciate my colleagues' desire to reassure our unions that we are going to be taking this location under the wing of the system, I would rather that we put something on the agenda for our next meeting so that the public has an opportunity to be aware of what we're proposing and can weigh in on it. Um, I feel very strongly that we should be managing this park like every other park in the system, not giving it any more or any less um, than we are giving every other resident of the city in terms of recreational opportunities and operations support. Um, so if we need to put together a resolution, um, that would come forward at our next meeting, specifying for staff that we want them to put together a plan that achieves that. Um, I would be fully supportive of us doing so. I'd also like us to talk to um, the city council and the mayor about requesting a transfer of the remaining $600,000 from the convention center special fund for the commons to the NPRB operations budget so that we can utilize that money to support the new costs that will be incurred by maintaining this space. Um, I don't know how many of you have been to the Commons, but uh, when they built it out, they clearly built it out in a way that wasn't intended to be maintained um, as part of a system. It was built out in a way that was meant to be maintained on a one-off special basis. Um, there's a lot of elements to it that really don't work with the way that we do business. Um, for example, the trash cans don't work with our equipment. They're incredibly um, 
difficult to empty from what I can tell. I would imagine that they will cause workman's comp issues for us. So I'd hope that we will, as part of that resolution, explore replacing those with something that's safer for our staff to use. Um, the concrete that was utilized is really fancy, um, and you can't use snow removal um, equipment on it without damaging it. So, you know, we're going to also have to take into consideration the costs associated with having to replace that as it breaks down um, with standard maintenance techniques. Uh, the play equipment that they installed is constantly breaking. So that's going to be a huge expense for us. I, I would like to understand um, what the warranties, if any, there are on that equipment outstanding so that if we need to, excuse me, <coughs> so that if we need to, we have the ability and opportunity to have that equipment replaced or repaired, not on the taxpayer dollar. Um, I'm really concerned about the police needs in this space. Um, I spend quite a bit of time in the commons when I work downtown and yeah, there's there's security folks interacting with people quite regularly. Um, and so I, I would like to understand the volume of incidents and um, how much time those incident responses take and what impact that might have on our ability for the park police to be able to respond to other components of the downtown area. Um, I had one more thing. Mm. Uh, as part of our agreement with the city, we said we would um, extend the contract through the end of March. So I'd really like to have, if we are passing a resolution talking about our staff taking it over, that we ask that the timeline for implementation of that changeover be when the other agreement expires so that there is a seamless transition uh, for the folks who have this as their neighborhood park. And that's all I got. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Sitch. Commissioner Severson for the first time. Thank you, Chair, our President Cowbill. Um, I just want to make um, something extremely clear that um, I want to make sure statements made by a commissioner up here are not misinterpreted by the public that myself or anyone in up here is interested in supporting the commons more than supporting parks, particularly in North Minneapolis, because I am not. However, what I am interested in doing is standing with our unions that work so hard for our parks to keep them maintained and updated every day. I will gladly support either Commissioner Bourne or Commissioner Meyer's resolution uh, for a simple statement that uh, we stand with our, our staff here at the park board and with that, including our union staff. So make no doubt about it. Commissioner Severson is not interested in supporting this park more than my north side parks. However, this is what is in front of us, and I'd like to deal with it, and I'd like to send a clear message to those listening and watching on how this board moves forward and standing with our unions. Thank you, Commissioner Severson. Commissioner Hassan. Thank you, uh, President Goldwell. I. I echo what uh, my previous, you know, the, uh, Commissioner French and Commissioner Silverson. But my question is, well, you know, we talked a little bit about Gold Medal Park, and I go to the park and just like Green Minneapolis. I'm a biker myself. I spend a lot of time in downtown, biking on uh, the park uh, River Parkway. So I've been there a couple of times late at night. And there's a security that's there 24 hours. And I heard Commissioner Musich saying that we treat all parks equally. And if we're going to monitor 24 hours at a park, we should be monitoring 24 hours, all parks, particularly the park that I grew up in, PV Park. Thank God now it's good. You know, we have done a lot of work as a chair of my neighborhood uh, in Finjura Village. We put a lot of resources that came out from our buckets, our, you know, like, putting together events like Safe PV Park Celebration, Safe PV Park Project. Uh, that was a public uh, money, and I, think, I feel like we should be doing the same thing if we're going to treat one park different because of the private developers that live there or the people that live there. 
I, I, my question is what is making different than other parks? If anyone can answer, why are we monitoring this park 24 hours? Why just security? For instance, if I'm coming from, if I want to cross, if I'm walking, it's easy for me to walk through the park than to go around the park to get to where I want to get. So, and I've had like the incident, you guys can come with me tonight. They will block you. The security will say, nope, you can't come in, go back. Even though I'm not stopping there or sitting there, you guys can try. And I think one thing that will make it different, you know, uh, with the uh, private union, you know, what uh, Commissioner French talked about, if this was our park put employees, they care about us. They care about the people, the taxpayers. They will welcome any, you know, park staff that works in a park. You can tell the difference. I have to beg, you know, even though I didn't want to use it. I didn't want to say I'm a commissioner of Minneapolis Parks and use my power, but I still walked around just like anyone else. But I, I'm hearing here some commissioners saying that uh, we should be treating all parks equally, but at the same time voting against a motion that's benefiting the public and having a park you know, staff that really cares about the taxpayers, that really cares about uh, the people. And they have been working for the park board. And I'm inviting all of you. I don't know if anyone's going to send this video live, but you guys are welcome to walk with me tonight or anyone. They'll, the security will block you and say you cannot walk. Even though we can walk through any other parks, PV Park, Gold Meadow Park, any other park across the city of Minneapolis. But we're monitoring and we're paying 24-hour service monitoring to a green Minneapolis that there's just security that's driving around, not even communicating, you know. I mean, now it's cold, I get it, but even in the wintertime. <coughs> So I invite, you know, like, I, I welcome, you know, uh, Brad Bones, you know, uh, Commissioner Brad Bones at Resolution. And I think we should be giving this, uh, th this jobs to our union brothers and sisters that have already working for us, that are already out there. And if this, if some of my commissioners really mean that, you know, we should treat all e parks equally, we should be. Not that it's speaking against and then not just talking, just talking, talking, you know, do the talk, the talk, but not the walk, the walk. And I'm tired of this. You know, this has been happening for so many years. Uh, I'm going to be off, you know, the subject a little bit in here. Pests are uh, getting rid of the chemicals that we use in our park system. We've been here two years and we haven't done nothing because of some commissioners that are just sitting here lying to the public line to be, you know, taxpayers. And the same thing is happening to the commons here. Now I'm back to if you're happy about it, okay? Uh, now I'm back to the point. You don't shut me off, please, okay? And please do not disturb when I'm talking. This is disrespectful. Commissioners, what do you, what Commissioner do you do? Hassan has the floor. What you're doing is disrespectful, Commissioner, Commissioner. Commissioner Hassan, if you could don't speak me to up, the Don't cut me off, Mr. Point. President. I, you, just I, like anyone else. If you could just speak to the No, what you're doing item. is completely wrong. Just like anyone else, I have the floor, and I can say whatever I want. And they can't have this, you know, like mistreating us. One time they do mistreating, the, you know, the former uh, superintendent, Mary Merrill, another time, uh, the current superintendent, myself as a commissioner. I can sit here and read a book if I want. This is disrespectful, what are you doing? I don't disturb other people when they're talking. And this commissioner sitting next to me, what she's doing is completely wrong. I'm, I care about my district. You know, the PV Park, when it was there, Meg Foney hasn't talked about it. You know, PV Park celebration, you know, and uh, the park that I grew up. And now Commons came in. Now they, they want to support private developers. And now they, they're trying to make it look good and monitor their parks for 24 hours. This is completely wrong and unacceptable. And now you're gonna shut me off? Go ahead, take the mic if you want. You can have the mic if you want. Give it to uh, someone else. 
Thank you, Commissioner Hassan. Commissioner Bourne. Thank you. Uh, thank you, President Cogill. Um, it sounds like a motion to enter closed session would also not be entertained, so I do want to spend a little bit of time. Uh, the motion, uh, the discussion item tonight was also the history of the January permit agreement, so I want to spend a little bit of time discussing that. Uh, before I move into that, uh, there is also a fourth option that we haven't discussed, and if this is a park that the Minneapolis Park Board never planned to operate and may not be able to operate without sacrificing other neighborhood parks, this board has the option to sell it. And I, there might be many, many um, interested buyers downtown that would buy the property with the restrictive covenants. I can think of people serving people or St. Stephen's that could have some very, uh, people serving people's right across the street. Uh, there's a lot of real good things we could do with the park if we're not able to if we're not able to operate it um, and that could provide a source of income to better maintain all of the parks that we do have so that that's a fourth option I I hope that the um, I hope that we retain this park uh, but if we can't come to an agreement there is always that option and I'd be I'd be willing to look at that um, but but to the permit I just wanted to go back to the history of the permit that was issued, I think, on December 31st um, through, I think it was January 23rd, 24th, and just discuss the legality of that. Uh, staff had cited and legal counsel had cited the assistant superintendent's authority under um, uh, resolution 13, or uh, Park Board Ordinance 13.5, um, which is around the um, issuance of construction permits and temporary um, temporary access permits um, the it, it's one, uh, park board ordinance 13.5 is one of the only ordinances in our entire code of ordinances that spells out that violation of this code, code of ordinance is a crime it's a misdemeanor it's a, uh, I believe it says it in 13 um, 13.5, I'll, I'll pull, uh, 13.5.5, the violation of any provision in this chapter is a misdemeanor. 13.5.1 and 13.5.2 are very clear about what the purpose of Ordinance 13.5 is. Uh, the purpose of the ordinance it, it, in that chapter is to effectively administrate requests for access for non-park uses that impact parkways and or parkland. Um, 15 point or 1352 goes on to say um, that unless otherwise provided, um, temporary access for permits are required for any non park construction related parkway. Um, it goes on to say that uh, any, um, any permit request not related to non park uses are shall be denied. Uh, and the ordinance is very clear. I, I did a public data request that all that information was shared with commissioners. Uh, ordinance 13.5 was brought up at our last meeting. Some commissioners said that they didn't have time to familiar, familiarize themselves with that ordinance at the time. I hope that those commissioners that had that concern had the opportunity to review that ordinance that staff cited as their authority. Um, the um, 13.5.12, no permit under this chapter shall be approved if the construction or use of park property will be in violation of any federal, state, or local laws, ordinances, and rules, and no permit shall be approved prior to the granting of any required additional federal, state, and local agency permits. Uh, in other words, um, the enforcement ordinance of the Minneapolis Park Board 651 refers to any ordinance or resolution of the park board as an ordinance or a um, or included or, or included in in consideration of 13.5. Um, my data request is only partially complete. I have I, I have some concerns on, on how how long a simple data request is taking for um, for an item of business that 
at the time the data request was made happened pr less than 30 days ago. I do understand that staff are under-resourced and overburdened, but I, I'm a little concerned based on the um, based on the information that's come forward so far that a crime has been committed. Um, the the 990s of Green Minneapolis say spe their, that their specific use is to main uh, develop, maintain, and operate public uh, green spaces, including public parks. Their application on their construction permit uh, stated to provide maintenance and cleanup services in the Commons Park. That is, maintenance of the Commons Park is not a park use, and it's not construction access. And 13.5.1, for the purpose of the ordinance, clearly clearly shows that the authority exercised by the super, assistant superintendent was outside of the scope of the authority granted to the person that occupied that office in the ordinance. Um, the We've heard a lot of discussion on the federal level um, in recent days that violating the law is okay if the intent was good. Um, I believe in the rule of law, and I think that there is a reason that this ordinance in particular is spelled out it is spelled out as a criminal violation or a, a, a misdemeanor violation. The I, I don't doubt that the superintendent and assistant superintendent were doing what they thought was right. That doesn't mean they were allowed to do it. And if this board reaffirms that authority and that there's no consequences with the affirmation of the authority, we are setting a precedent that whenever, collect, whenever bargaining negotiations with AFSME or the Police Federation or 363 aren't going the way that we want them to, the assistant superintendent, whoever she or, she or he may be at the time, can issue a permit to a private security company to do the duties of our park police, can issue a permit to ask me to fill out paperwork at headquarters or to people to replace ask me workers can um, and can issue permits to pr private tree trimming services to go up and trim trees and, and shovel sidewalks and that is not the intent of this ordinance um, the and this board every member of this board that voted for the operating agreement that ended on December 31st I would have to assume knew that it ended on December 31st. I, I would hate to think that commissioners are voting on things that they don't understand, and I don't believe that to be the case. The Green, Green Minneapolis approached me about uh, including this on the agenda in the last meeting in December. I declined that because I, I believed that the agreement with Green Minneapolis was no longer in the best interest of the people of Minneapolis. That the agenda was put forward, and I believe every single member of this board voted on the agenda, knowing that that was the last opportunity to continue that operating agreement before it expired and before it went to Green Minneapolis. The, the communications that were happening between the executive team that you've all received copies of at this point is nothing more than a circumvention of the elected of the authority of this elected board and nobody in any of these conversations has denied that i think council rice at our last at our last meeting said that was the best they could do and didn't say that it wasn't a violation of the law and i just i believe in the rule of law i think we are setting an incredibly dangerous precedent and i don't want to give anyone in the on staff the authority to bring in an army of union busting scabs whenever whenever negotiations aren't going well. So um, so President Cogill, I, I would really hope and I'm asking you publicly now that at our next that at our next meeting in February, uh, we you place on the agenda a closed session to discuss a personnel issue and the um, and discuss what the consequences of are of committing a crime in the execution of an office. So thank you, and thank you for the time. You're welcome. Thank you, Commissioner Bourne, uh, Commissioner Forney. Oh, Commissioner, sorry, my, my apologies, Commissioner Meyer for the second time. No, mine's to the motion. Commissioner Forney, um, for the second time. I, 
I'm so stunned by the comments that were just made. Um, I believe that somebody's been pronounced guilty already. Um, I, I just have to go back and step that. So back in April, we as a board all voted in favor of continuing with Green Minneapolis. And if I hear what the 6th District Commissioner just said is he was given the opportunity to put it on the agenda so we as a board could acknowledge the December 31st expiration. And now, since staff, if I'm correct, continued the use of Green Minneapolis. Because, I mean, I'll just frankly <laughs> say that if nothing had happened, the liabilities of not maintaining that area would have been ours. And I believe that our staff is there to protect us. So if, if we were not given the opportunity to alter that course, I'm not sure why staff then is already declared the guilty party. So um, I'm, I'm, I'm having a lot of difficulty with the nature of this and uh, I hope that we will not be addressing this particular non-issue. Thank you, Commissioner Forney. Commissioner Musich. For the second time. For the second time. Uh, I have a question for you. In your opinion, as our legal counsel with extensive knowledge of our code of ordinances, um, was the ordinance in question violated by the actions of staff? Um, Mr. President, Commissioner Musich, um, in my opinion, looking at it, no. I said at the prior board meeting that I thought the staff did the best they could in the circumstances as they existed at the time. To the, I think there is such a thing as a good faith understanding of what their authority was and what they could do. From what I know of the circumstances, they did the best they could. They were acting in good faith and they were trying to implement what they thought the policy of the board would have been to continue the status quo until the litigation was resolved. Um, I think when words like crime are used, that's a very serious allegation. Um, in order to prove a crime, any type of crime, you have to have uh, an intent to violate a law. And I don't think there was any intent uh, to do that. And it, to the extent if there's, it, somebody wants to allege a violation of a crime, I don't, under the charter, that's a matter for ultimately the city attorney to decide if it's a misdemeanor uh, or a gross misdemeanor. Um, and I, I mean, I haven't done criminal law for a long time, but I don't see any crime of any type here, in okay. my opinion. Thank you for sharing that opinion with us. Um, that was all I had. I, I, I would ask that uh, Commissioner Cogill, or President Cogill, in your role as the board president, should we have expiring agreements coming forward with large ramifications for the institution and park spaces within the city, that you bring those items before the board so we have an opportunity to discuss them and make decisions about them. Uh, I'm disappointed that we didn't have an opportunity to have a conversation back in December about implementing a transition schedule at the conclusion of litigation uh, so that we'd be ready right now to have our staff taking over this space. Um, so, so in the future, I would just ask that we be given the opportunity as a body to have those discussions. Thanks. Thank you, Commissioner Musich. Uh, Commissioner uh, Hassan for the second time. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, can someone answer my question about why, why do we need to monitor 24 hours this park and what makes it different than the other parks? 
uh, I would Deputy Superintendent Ringle. Mm -hmm. um, President Cogill, Commissioner Hassan, the uh, current 24 hour security is a choice that's been made by Green Minneapolis. It's presented to you as that's the current condition on how it's being operated. It's not a requirement of the park um, unless there's something within um, the, the uh, I can't remember what we call it, but then the, unless there's something with the urban park use agreement that requires it, I don't think it would be a requirement of the board. Uh, if I could just um, get Mr. President, Commissioner Hassan, um, no, the, our parks um, have park hours and we allow people, I believe it's after 11 p.m. to 6 a.m. to go through the park unimpeded. They can't stay in the park, but they can walk through it. I don't know the particulars of the commons, but I think Secretary Ringgold is right. Green Minneapolis has used its money from the city to provide a 24 hours some sort of security coverage. We don't do that. That's, that's a choice they make. It's not a requirement of uh, anything that the park board has in its rules um, or uh, the urban park use agreement would require that either. The requirement of that agreement is that we maintain it to uh, the you know, urban park standard that the park board has, which would not require 24-hour service if we took it over, or 24-hour coverage. Does that answer your question? Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Commissioner Meyer, or Commissioner Hassan, my, my apologies. Um, my understanding is Commissioner Meyer's point is to uh, a the motion that he's suggesting. Um, just want to say a couple of things. Uh, I very much appreciate uh, the comments tonight because it gives me a good sense of where we want to go in the future, which is uh, what my interest is right now. Um, I've heard general consensus that we want to move towards um, affirmatively um, establishing uh, our uh, fantastic park staff in uh, managing the space at the Commons Park um, and look forward to Commissioner Meyer's um, proposed uh, resolution. Um, there are a variety of items that are still needing to be figured out uh, with the city and that will be uh, the work of myself, Vice President Vita and Superintendent Van Gora in the coming weeks. Um, my apologies for not having um, more of that figured out right now, but I think that there are some still pending decisions that, that both the city and the park board need to make, just as there were um, at the end of the, the last year. The resolution that we, uh, as a board, voted on, I think there was one abstention um, in that vote, uh, but uh, the resolution that we voted on in April included a variety of whereas clauses that articulated uh, a general understanding that uh, the the uh, agreement uh, with uh, Green Minneapolis would continue um, through the pending litigation. Um, in the letter of the resolution, Commissioner Bourne is certainly right, um, but in the will, it would be my understanding that, um, that throughout the, the board, there was a, a thought that we would be good partners and act, as uh, Council Rice said, in good faith um, with our partners um, including the city uh, to uh, re recognize a, s a solution to a incredibly complex <laughs> scenario that has landed us with a new park which I am so happy to say is in my district um, and and I'm also so happy to uh, have the invitation to walk with Commissioner Hassan this evening after the meeting um, to see what happens with the security forces uh, and I invite anybody else to come along with me I hope that Invitation is still standing, Commissioner Hassan. Um, all of that to say, um, at this point, uh, given the opinion of Council, um, I'm interested in moving positively forward with our uh, partners um, and moving f positively, positively forward with uh, a vision for a park that is operated by our staff that is going to be the best park that downtown's seen. Um, and um, with also just a, a nod of appreciation um, for all the partners who have made that park possible 
um, and having a new park in that space I, I think is great. Um, if there's interest by more commissioners in considering um, getting rid of park space, I think that sets uh, also a very dangerous pre precedent, but um, I'm open to hearing more about that since uh, Commissioner Bourne brought that up. Um, with that, uh, I see no other discussion on this item and I will entertain Commissioner Myers' um, light. Thank you. First, I just want to say that I am certainly receptive to having a closed session to just discuss uh, personnel issues. I prefer not to do it tonight, seeing that it's already 8.30 and uh, we have several other items on our agenda, but I would support uh, adding it at the February 19th meeting. Before I make my motion, I just want to speak to the appropriateness of it. Um, when we have discussion items, staff, you know, kind of try to read the tea leaves of, you know, what commissioners say in order to uh, get a sense of the of will of the board, and it does have uh, consequences. It's not just talking about whatever you want, and, you know, um, you know it actually has implications, what, you know, what is said in, in discussion items. Uh, today, I'm just one example um, for... Commissioner, can you, get to the, can you get to your motion, please? You had two chances to speak, and it's not fair that you didn't give me else. Commissioner Meyer has the floor. Um, with the um, why is that a proposal that uh, Stephen brought forward? You know, and the staff sent a letter to the planning <coughs> commission noting uh, that no one um, had spoken in favor um, of, of using that space for storm water. So I mean, that's just one example of um, when a discussion item you know is used um, to demonstrate the, the will of the board. I think in uh, the motion that I'm putting forward today that you know, maintains the spirit um, of, of the discussion item. You know, it, it tells staff uh, with more clarity what the will of the board is at this time. The will of the board can change. Um, if Commissioner Gordon wants to bring something else forward uh, that you know, we want to consider later on, if you know, we're not able to follow through with all the things that we want to do, um, you know, that's something that we can consider later, but I want to proceed uh, with, with my motion uh, to just demonstrate what the will of the board is at this time. Uh, so I move to suspend the rules uh, for the purpose of um, proposing a motion to express that the will of the Minneapolis Park and Recreation Board of Commissioners is that staff should prepare to take over the entire operations of the commons. Second. There has been a motion to suspend the rules and there has been a second. Is there any discussion? Seeing none. I don't. Oh, there's no discussion. All those in favor of, re of the motion su to suspend ask the rules? I will ask for a roll call. Commissioner Bourne? Aye. Commissioner Musage? No. Commissioner Severson? Aye. Commissioner Myers? Aye. Commissioner Hassan? Yes. Commissioner French? Aye. Commissioner Forney? Aye. President Kogil? Aye. Commissioner Hassan? No. You have six ayes, two nays, one absent. All right. Uh, thank you. Uh, that carries. The, mo the rules have been suspended. Um, so you want to read it again? Yes. I'm Commissioner Meyer. Um, I'd like to move a motion to express that the will of the Minneapolis Park and Recreation Board of Commissioners is that staff should prepare to take over the entire operations of the Commons. Uh, Commissioner uh, Myers' motion has been made. Is there a second to the motion? Second. There's a second uh, from Commissioner French. Is there any discussion? There is Commissioner Bourne. Uh, thank you, President Cogill. Um, I, I'm curious. I uh, went with this for the purposes of discussion, but I, I'm not understanding the substantial and material difference from the resolution a few minutes prior. And if the motion maker could, uh, if the motion maker could elaborate, a few minutes prior. You mean like an hour? Yeah. Sure. <laughs> when, oh, when you make your motion, saying. sure. Um, uh, there are a couple differences uh, that I see. One is I, I did not put a date, and um, you know one of the commissioners said that it would be redundant to enter into uh, contract renegotiations. I don't know if that's true or not. Uh, so I wanted to put mine in the broadest possible terms. Thank you. Um, 
I, I believe I'll speak in favor of the motion, though, though I certainly understand where our sisters and brothers in our collective bargaining units may not be reassured by words as much as they're reassured by actions, and we're not seeing anything more than words tonight. Um, and I, I just get really, I, I said this at our last meeting, this is the most controversial issue that that this board has dealt with in my entire term and with in in all friendship and respect to our legal counsel are, are the the only the only attorney that has been right every single time on every single lawsuit has been former council president Ostro and and I'm I'm nervous that we're opening up challenges to our collective, uh, opening up potential lawsuits to our collective bargaining agreements, or from our collective, from our from our unions. Um, I and every lawsuit that we have lost so far, we have lost by trying to be a little too cute, and skirting a rule here, getting a different interpretation of a rule there, and I, I'm. I, I guess I'm going to make a personal request of our collective bargaining units watching tonight. I understand that these are words tonight and not actions, but I'm asking you not to sue us yet. <laughs> um, the, and I, I'm hopeful that the words of the board will reconcile with the actions of the board soon. And, and I know that hasn't always been the experience that our collective bargaining units have have realized with uh, with some very very critical issues around your livelihoods, and so I'm I'm hopeful that our words will very soon reconcile with our actions, and our actions will reconcile with our words. Thank you, Commissioner Bourne, Commissioner Musich. Thank you, President Kogel. Um, since we're going to just not try to do this in a thoughtful way, and we're just going to throw something together on the dais. Um, I'd prefer that we amend the language to state that we would like staff to bring forward a plan for transitioning operation of this space from Green Minneapolis to the Minneapolis Park and Recreation Board no later than March, um, whatever our first meeting in March is, so that we can be assured that we understand what's going on, what it's going to cost, how it's going to happen, um, and that all of our staff uh, understands that as well. I'll second. Is, is that a friendly amendment? Yes. That's a friendly amendment. We'll just include it in the amendment that was made. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Musich. Did the secretary get the whole thing? Mm -hmm. Commissioner Bourne for the second time. Uh, thank you. If we're, uh, if we're offering friendly amendments, um, I would go back to have an implementation date be April 1st, which is what our current operating agreement, our current operating agreement expires on March 31st. So would the motion maker be uh, agreeable to having an effective date in his uh, resolution of April 1st? But that was exactly my rationale for not doing it. I mean, um, first, maybe we're gonna yeah, you know, please, um, Commissioner Meyer. You know, at the previous meeting, uh, I, I suggested that you know I put forward a motion that um, the lease term should be extended. I forget how long, but um, you know I want to make sure that staff have that uh, flexibility if, if they need to to do something, if they need to come back to us to have an extension. I you know would be willing to support that. So. Um, I guess the, you know, that would not be a friendly amendment. You could um, make it as a unfriendly one, I guess. <laughs> uh, then, uh, I, I would move to amend Commissioner Myers, uh, Commissioner Myers' motion uh, to have an implementation date of April 1st. There has been a motion to amend the motion. Uh, is there a second? Is there a second? A second. second. There is a second. Is there any discussion? Commissioner Bourne? No, no. Commissioner Musich? Thank you, President Kogel. 
Um, I'm just interested in hearing from staff if they think bringing forward a, a plan by the first meeting in March and implementation by the 1st of April is achievable. Assistant Superintendent Barrick. President Kogel, Commissioner of Such Commissioners. Um, <coughs> April 1st is, we're, we're already taking, in preparing for this, you know, outlining what we would need. Um, I think the challenge with April 1st would only be that we typically bring our seasonals on April 15th. So we would have a two week period where we're in our winter staffing numbers before we get into our summer staffing numbers. Um, and then the big question becomes the, um, the money from the city, if that can be used to hire additional park keepers and a crew leader, et cetera, that we laid out. Um, otherwise, what we would have to do is kind of figure out a way to move pieces around the city um, with the spring bid or whatever um, to, to get those resources more closer to that park and so that we can do it with what we have. But you believe that you'd be able to put together a plan either with or without that money um, that would allow us to take over that space April 1st? Yes. We okay. Would be able We're not to, asking for something unrealistic is what I'm trying to get at. It would be a plan to take it over. I don't know that we would meet the current standards, and I don't exactly know what it would mean for the rest of the park system. Okay. And I guess that would be some clarity you'd like from us, is if we want the park to be maintained to um, what the standard park standards are or what the current standards of the operation of that space is? Correct. Yes. Okay. So... Um, do we as a body want to clarify that through this motion that we would like this space maintained to the same standards as the Minneapolis Park and Recreation Board's neighborhood parks? Uh, Commissioner Musich, uh, to that question, um, I, I would look to Commissioner Meyer if he wants to expand upon it, but I, I thought that I heard pretty clearly across the board during the discussion that there was an interest in this being operated like any other Minneapolis park and I think that's already been heard by staff um, so with that uh, Commissioner Bourne's uh, amendment uh, has been moved and seconded there are no, there's no other discussion um, all those in favor of Commissioner Bourne's amendment please signify by saying aye uh, Commissioner Meyer has requested a roll call. Commissioner Board. Aye. Commissioner Musich. Aye. Commissioner Severson. Aye. Commissioner Meyer. No. Commissioner Hassan. Aye. Commissioner French. Aye. Commissioner Forney. No. President Kogan. Aye. You have six ayes, two nays, one absent. That motion carries uh, now to the uh, uh, original motion with the amended date uh, that Commissioner Meyer proposed uh, has been moved and seconded. Is there seeing no discussion? All those in favor of the motion with Commissioner Bourne's amendment, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? So moved. Well, that was very impressive. All right. Um, thank you all for your collaboration this evening. Um, moving on to new business. Um, I'll move resolution 2020-132, resolution consenting to, pursuant to section 5.2 of lease agreement with the Lopet Foundation Mill Valley Kitchen as a subleasee and subtenant of the Lopez Foundation at Theater Worth Regional Park within Adventure Welcome Center building, the trailhead, and requiring the Lopez Foundation to include implicit bias and uh, racial equity training for all Lopez employees, leadership, and Lopez board members in the year 2020 using a qualified organization to be <coughs> recommended by MPRB staff and approved by the Board of Commissioners. The resolution has been moved. Is there a second? There's a second with the correction of instead of include, it was the word is provide in the motion. Provide implicit bias. Okay. What? I didn't hear. I'm sorry. Provide. Um, when yes. Meg was reading this, provide. she read she 
Okay. To include implicit bias, and I'm just correcting the record to note that it's okay. provide implicit bias. The resolution has been moved and seconded. Commissioner Severson. Thank you, President Coburn. Um, so this is, um, I just want to be clear that um, my stance on this after being sick is I wanted to do my due diligence um, from a letter that, an email that I received, and um, I just wanted to make sure we were doing the right things and setting up um, not only the Lope for success, but also Mill, is it Mill City? Mill Valley Kitchen. Um, but most, you know, most importantly, I want people to know that we want to see success happen in our parks. We want a partner. Um, but more importantly than all that is, I, the north side is underrepresented in the park board every single day. Every single day we hear folks come out and speak and, and just add up the numbers of how many people from North Minneapolis we see. I charge everybody involved in our parks, including the Lopet Foundation, in reaching out and engaging north side residents. I actually received a strategy uh, from a member of the Lopet Foundation. Now, I won't go through it. It was a pretty good strategy, and I don't think they were off on, on, on many things they said about commissioners, but the very last thing that they said in some of their strategies um, when they were talking about commissioners was, um, and, and, and I, I'm reading verbatim, as for Brad, Kale, and AK, my sense is they are going to need to hear from their constituents. And I like that. That's exactly what I need to hear. I am interested in speaking to my constituents because they're the ones who sat me in this seat. One thing that was frustrating, though, is I did not hear from my constituents at the rate I wish I could have. Um, I still receive most of my emails from southwest Minneapolis and other parts of the city, and that's disappointing. Um, with that, um, I want everyone to know is I, I want to see this place successful. I look forward to these folks moving in, um, and I would encourage all other board members, as I asked before uh, the meeting, to vote with me in supporting um, this lease. Thanks. Thank you, Commissioner Severson, uh, Commissioner Horney, followed by Bourne. Thank you, um, President Kogel. Um, I appreciate the intent of the um, the resolution compared to what we originally had on the agenda. Um, and what is encouraging is that I believe that the LOPA has already been proactively taking the steps that are being inferred here about the um, implicit bias and racial equity, um, as I think we all witnessed at the last board meeting, whenever it was. Anyway, um, um, Executive Director R.T. Ryback was here from the Minneapolis Foundation speaking to um, the fact that this is one of the things that they have been working proactively with the LOPET. And so um, the way that this is reading, it is saying that um, we, the park board, would be the ones to um, recommend, select, um, and approve, um, whereas they already have a pre-existing um, contract with the foundation directly talking about this. So I would like to amend the resolution um, to reflect what is already in action by um, the local, and that it would read that the resolution consenting to pursuant to section 5.2 of the lease agreement with the Lopet Foundation Mill Valley Kitchen as the sub lacy and subtenant of the Lopet Foundation at the Theater Worth Regional Park within the Adventure Welcome Center, the Trailhead, and separately authorizing MPRB staff to cooperate with, instead of requiring, cooperate with the Lopet Foundation to pursue a grant from the Minneapolis Foundation to provide implicit bias and racial equity training for Lopet leadership in the year of 2020 using a qualified organization um, selected by the Lopet Foundation in consultation with the Minneapolis Foundation. Thank you, Commissioner Forney. Uh, is there a second to Commissioner Forney's amendment? Second. 
Uh, there has been a motion and a second to Commissioner Forney's uh, amendment. Um, and I am going to ask if there's any discussion on this. Uh, start with Commissioner Bolton. Thank you, uh, uh, President Cogill. Um, I have some questions on the main motion, but I'll just speak to the amendment right now. Um, it, it's, it's certainly a mouthful, and it's certainly a lot of different information that was presented on the dais tonight. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm baffled by the first district commissioner's seconding of the motion minutes after his statement that he was not inclined to support actions like this from the dais. Um, the, the public's had an opportunity to, um, to work on the main motion. I, I really want to applaud um, Commissioner French for his leadership in, in putting this together and putting together the original motion and putting together something that um, would meet Commissioner Severson's concerns of making the LOPIT successful uh, and meet this entire board's concerns of having a successful partnership. Um, this is a pretty complicated change to do from the diet, so I don't think I can support that. If it if it passes, I, I don't know if I can support the main motion as amended with the incredible change that's happening on it tonight from the dais. Thank you, Commissioner Bourne. Uh, Commissioner French. I just want to talk about this, uh, this, uh, this resolution, uh, and this, this lease agreement, uh, it's been a very tumultuous couple weeks, a couple months, uh, having conversations about this. I've had many talks with um, fellow commissioners about this and how we should proceed. And there was a lot of back and forth, a lot of discussion of what, what should happen and what, what should happen in the future. How do we best set up Mill, Val Mill, is it Mill Valley? Mill Valley Kitchen. Mill, Mill Valley Kitchen to be successful. and. How do we encourage black and brown businesses in the future to operate in our parks? So there's a lot of discussion that went on this. I, right now, I would encourage folks to leave the language as is. It's a very sensitive issue. I, let's leave the language as is, and let's let's get through this very tip, you know very difficult uh, resolution that's brought a lot of strife and 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 disagreement on this board. Let's just. Let's, let's just do what we got right now. That's that's what I have. <coughs> Thank you, Commissioner French, Commissioner Meyer. Sorry. Thank you. I'll speak to my second. Um, and just explain that <coughs> if you want my vote for something, you should share it with me. In this case, this amendment was shared with me beforehand. So I, you know, I said previously that I was hesitant um, to vote on something that I had, you know, hadn't had the chance to review. Um, for this one, I have, and my understanding of what this basically changes is who <laughs> selects uh, the trainers, and my understanding is that uh, the Minneapolis Foundation um, is the one that would be paying for it. Uh, so for that reason, it made sense to me that they should be the ones that are able to select them. Thank you, uh, Commissioner Meyer, Commissioner Severson. Uh, thank you, President Calgar. I, I a few things. Um, so. This is a this is a tough sell for me, but I just want all the commissioners to know that um, just because you ask me for something doesn't mean I'm going to support it. Because if it doesn't follow my morals and values and it doesn't help my constituents in North Minneapolis, it's going to be a tough sell. But if this motion passes, I will not be able to vote uh, on this lease this evening. Thank you, Commissioner Severson. That's Commissioner I just want to echo Commissioner Severson's. I would not be able to vote on this if this motion passed. Thank you, Commissioner French. Um, I don't see any other uh, lights on. I'll just say uh, you know, I uh, worked with uh, Commissioner French on the language that is brought forward tonight uh, and in the spirit of um, working together on this, I felt like there was uh, a good consensus there and I uh, would like to continue with the language that was brought forward on the agenda so I can't support the amendment. Um, with that being said, I guess I'll ask the secretary to take the role on uh, Commissioner Forney's uh, amendment. Commissioner Bourne? No. Commissioner Musage? No. 
Commissioner Severson? No. Commissioner Meyer? Aye. Commissioner Hassan? Yes. Commissioner French? No. Commissioner Forney? Aye. President Kogan? No. Commissioner Hassan? Yes. Aye. You have three ayes, five nays, one absent. Uh, the uh, amendment fails um, to the main resolution. Commissioner Bourne, do you have new information? Uh, I'd like to speak to the main motion. Okay. Uh, thank you, President Cogill. Um, just a really brief point of clarification. At, at our uh, last regular meeting, there, uh, the public and commissioners had received um, some, a, a series of what I can only call some pretty alarming allegations from our previous vendor. Um, at the time uh, that those were received, uh, I had asked, um, I had talked to council and the superintendent about doing, looking into the validity of, of that letter. I, I think that there were a lot of things in it that might be a frustrated previous officer, but there were also some pretty serious things that needed to be looked at. I, I'm assuming since I didn't get a response that staff had looked, uh, staff and council had looked into that, uh, to the allegations that were in that letter and there were no significant concerns brought. There were staff looked at it and there were no significant concerns. Superintendent or council, can you address that? Council? Um, yes, Mr. President, uh, we did look into those uh, emails that, on this issue. Uh, Lana Mosley from our office did it and uh, she concluded that there was nothing that uh, okay. rose to the level of the need for further action or report to the board. Okay. It included it's basically a business dispute between the two parties. Thank you, thank you, Council and Superintendent. Your staff, if they did any additional, that that's their opinion as well. Sorry, Mr. Uh, board. Yes. Okay. I, thank you, and again, thanks to this board for taking that uh, for going through that due diligence. Um, I when people allege things we have to take that seriously um i'll also again just applaud uh commissioner french for really uh putting together something that i'm hopeful that the entire board can get behind and, and i'll also just say uh, prior to commissioner severson just a few moments ago I, I think commissioner french was the only commissioner that asked me to vote for this and that certainly means a lot and i'm I'm happy to support something that I think that this entire board can get behind. So I'd encourage commissioners to pass this as well. Thank you, Commissioner Bourne. Commissioner French. <coughs> yeah, uh, uh, Commissioner Bourne and President Calgo. Uh, there, this was a um, very tumultuous issue. I went in to add some discussions with uh, former Mayor R.T. Ryback about uh, possibly uh, generating some funds or resources so we can possibly uh, open up concession stands at Weber Pool and the other place was North Common. So there, there are conversations that are being had with with many people from the Minneapolis Foundation in uh, an agreement for the future to uh, actually bring some resources to a place where there are where there's a vacuum of places to eat and enjoy yourself. Uh, North Minneapolis. Uh, so that is very encouraging and uh, a few back and forth conversations with uh, former Mayor R.T. Ryback and he assured me that this is something that he wants to work on with me and the park board. Uh, he also was one of the ones that suggested the, uh, the, the training for the Lopez staff. So I wanted to make sure that we are being uh, loyal to the agreement and that's one of the reasons I voted against the amendment but I am willing to support this lease agreement uh, with a few caveats I, I want folks to know that I am very sensitive to issues when it comes to black and brown folks just I just am and I will be watching to see the future and see how we move on from this point from now on right how do we where do we go in the future hopefully we'll be making some uh, some changes that will benefit whoever's in that space 
six weeks from now, a year from now, five years from now. And this is really important to me. It's really important that black and brown folks have a place to go and a place to do business at. So uh, with all that being said, I this has probably been one of the most tough times for me, one of the most toughest decisions I've had to make as a commissioner because I want to be supportive of black and brown businesses. <laughs> and I don't want what happened to this young lady, whether the, whether the allegations are true or not, I don't want that to happen again. I don't want a black or brown business owner to leave with a very sour taste in their mouth and, and go out into the public and say, hey, I had a bad experience working, at the, working uh, with the park board. That can't happen again. So let's move on from here. I'm going to encourage my uh, fellow commissioners to vote on this. Uh, hopefully in the future we would have uh, a very harmonious relationship with with a uh, with the trailhead, and I would encourage folks from the I would encourage trailhead uh, leadership to possibly doing something nice for folks on the north side. Maybe I don't know, opening up a free day of a uh, 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 tube bin or something. You know, maybe we get with okay. Kel and or me and figure out what what on the north side that folks would love to come and enjoy that place. Because my my big concern is that it becomes a uh, a country club for rich folks. And I know that's not what the intent of that place is to be. And I want to make sure we're staying true true to that, right? So with that being said, I plan on voting for this lease tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner French, Commissioner Hassan. Thank you, Commissioner Corio. Uh, I'll say the same thing. You know, I think uh, Commissioner French uh, said it all. Uh, He's the only person that reached me out, and uh, I, I, I respect his leadership and his uh, and his research of figuring out how we can bring this board together that's divided. And uh, and I guess it's clear that, uh, and I appreciate for all you doing, uh, Commissioner French, not just here in the board but also outside in the community. The same thing that I ask, you know, our partners also the Lobby Foundation is. I, I sat down with uh, the, the CEO, the executive director. Uh, John Munger, uh, months before, uh, just doing some outreach in the Somali community and also supporting some of the activities that happen. You know, sports, winter sports are not sports that the Somali kids play in the East Africans. Just making, <coughs> just uh, figuring a way that they can support and doing the partnership is what I've asked and, uh, and looking forward to work with him. And I also urge my colleagues to support this lease. Thank you, Commissioner Hassan. Uh, with that, will the secretary please take the roll? Can we vote anonymously? No, it's a lease. <laughs> Commissioner Bourne. Aye. Commissioner Musich. Aye. Commissioner Severson. Aye. Commissioner Myers. Aye. Commissioner Hassan. Aye. Commissioner French. Aye. Commissioner Forney. Aye. President Cogill. Aye. You have eight ayes, one absent. Thank you. Uh, that resolution carries. Um, that will move on to petitions and communications. And I'll start with oh, actually, that's not the case. I'm sorry. Uh, we have one more item here, and that is 2019-126. Uh, I have a motion on 2020-126. Which is the Southwest Service Area comment period opening? No, it no. is off of uh, consent. It's what? 2020-126, correct. Can you read it to us? Yes, I would like somebody to move resolution 2020-126, a resolution authorizing a professional services agreement with Stonebrook Engineering to provide topographic and Alta land surveying services at Cedar Lake, Lake of the Isles, part of the Chain of Lakes Regional Park for a fee not to exceed $126,092 and contingent on the City of Minneapolis civil rights approval. So moved. Is there second. a second? There's been a motion and a second. 
Um, I, I brought this up uh, because I just uh, it is something that is happening in, in my district and it's part of the last master planning process of the, the city and I uh, just want to confirm two things. Uh, one, um, that areas that aren't being surveyed with the Alta land surveying, surveying services have indeed been surveyed around both lakes. Um, and then two, uh, if there is any plan for notification of neighbors if there is going to be surveying that's happening around their properties, or if that's not going to happen. Uh, President Pogel, the critical areas around the lake um, um, will have a labor survey, particularly along the channel and then around the south, sea, the south uh, shore and including the area where the South Cedar Beach was constructed. So we have those areas previously. Uh, we are not doing a survey of all the properties. For instance, on the north side of the lake where it's clear we already own and won't have encroachments, we won't be doing a survey. Um, we typically do notifications to neighbors before or as we um, move through the area, and we can make certain we do that by gov delivery and other methods. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, seeing no other questions or discussion, all those in favor of uh, resolution 2020-126, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? So moved. Now I'll we'll move into petitions and communications. Uh, Commissioner Hassan. Okay. Commissioner Musich. Thank you, this week I was sworn in on the um, audit committee, and I would just like to share with my colleagues that uh, this year's audit plan for the city of Minneapolis does include um, a park board item. It's Park Board Patron and Safety in Aquatics. Um, so the audit staff at the city will be reviewing whether Park Board Aquatic Safety and Maintenance Practices align with policies and pro program goals that's scheduled to begin um, in quarter four of this year. And I'll be reporting back on the outcome of that audit should I still be the appointee to the Planning Commission at the time that that comes forward. Thank you. Uh, that's all I got. Get out and ice skate because the rings are awesome. Thank you, uh, Commissioner M Musich. Uh, Commissioner French. I just wanted to say uh, how much I enjoy serving the city of Minneapolis as a park board commissioner. It has truly been the joy of my life. And if you'd ask me if this type of work I've been doing 20 years ago, 20 years before this, I would have told you, get out of here. So this has truly been a privilege to serve the people of Minneapolis, and I just wanted to take this time to uh, express that. Thank you, Commissioner French. Commissioner Meyer. Pass. Yeah. Commissioner Bourne. I'll pass. Commissioner Severson. Uh, I just wanted to, I'm sad that <coughs> so many people have left. It's pretty much just our staff here this <laughs> evening, but still going to share it. One thing that's been important to me on the north side is rebuilding and restarting uh, sports councils. I have this theory that the park board. Um, wanted to take the power from the people and make decisions by themselves. And, and what happened with that is all the athletic councils on the north side basically died and there's nothing left. And there are a few left on the south side, you know, when they have uh, more privileges and more money, that's something that they could sustain. But with that, um, we, uh, I, I challenged a few angry parents this past year to start a sports council at Farview Park. Uh, and as we know, uh, if you know anything about Northside Athletics, Gary Wilson was in charge of that for many, many, many years. And now we have a new president um, and uh, pretty much a new slate. And I'm excited to help them try to rebuild this board and be involved in a microcosm of government. And, and it's important to me because that's where I kind of got my start in small government world, I guess, as the sec uh, vice president, excuse me, of the Follow Sports Council as just a 20-year-old man. So this is this could lead to the next person sitting in the seat, which I'm super excited about. Thanks. Thank you, Commissioner Severson. Commissioner Forney. Pass. Uh, thank you, Commissioner Forney. Um, many of the speakers are not here tonight that we're speaking about pesticides. I uh, just uh, want to say for the record, um, that it is still uh, my intention uh, to uh, work with the uh, uh, chair of the Operations and Environment Committee to come forward with a, resol a resolution regarding a timeline for uh, or regarding providing uh, direction to the Pesticide Advisory Committee for a timeline uh, 
to evaluate a timeline to transition to the uh, OMRI, or organic management uh, uh, list of um, approved uh, organic uh, materials, uh, products um, that are used according to the USDA National Organics Program. Um, I have been um, uh, very much uh, impressed by the consistency and um, passion of folks who really want this uh, evaluated, and I think it behooves the board to be clear in uh, our direction to do that. Um, I think it's also very fair that commissioners have time to speak with the Pesticide Advisory Committee members who have been serving on this uh, in this capacity for about a year now um, to really understand uh, the work they have been doing and what they want to see in the future. Um, so uh, we'll be uh, waiting uh, to uh, bring that forward, but it is uh, the intent that that happens quickly. Um, I think it's really valuable, just quickly to speak on this, <laughs> uh, to, to think about uh, this alternative list of products, um, uh, partly because of the fact that the, the list of, the, the way in which the EPA and national governmental organizations have uh, regulated or determined what's safe uh, in terms of uh, chemicals and synthetic pesticides um, has largely for the, in, the history of having that body been, uh, been regulated by the companies themselves. And um, that's incredibly problematic and not very, um, uh, it's not something that we can hang our hat on. So I, I, I really think it's, it behooves us to evaluate an alternative list of products. Um, and with that, I would ask to uh, adjourn the regular it, meeting of the park board. Are we having something in advance from uh, planning? We are not. Good. There's no planning. Okay. Sorry. Sorry. Yep. Yeah. Move to adjourn. Uh, there has been a motion to adjourn. There's been a second. Uh, all those in favor of adjournment, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? We are adjourned. Time being 9.15. I'd like to call to order. Uh, the meeting of the Recreation Committee, uh, Secretary, please call the roll. Commissioner Musich. Second. Commissioner Hassan. Here. Vice Chair Severson. Present. Chair French. Aye. Do you have a form? All right, so we are going to switch up a little bit from the agenda. We have a guest from the... We need to approve our agenda. What's that? We need to approve our agenda. Oh, I'm sorry. We just uh, I'll uh, entertain a motion to approve the agenda. So moved. All in favor of approving the agenda, say aye. 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 All opposed? Extension. I'd entertain a motion to approve the minutes from Wednesday, January 8th, 2020. So moved. All in favor of approving the minutes from Jan uh, January 8th, January 8th, 2020, say aye. 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 All opposed? Abstentions? Thank you. Uh, so we have two action items. We're going to move one of these action items ahead. Study, study report items. Excuse me? They're study report items. Okay. Yeah. Study report items, Commissioner uh, Musi says. Study report items. Uh, and we're going to move one up hand because we have a guest from the Youth Coordinating Board that's been sitting here uh, dealing with all our, uh, our wranglings, our de democratic process. So I want to say thank you for staying here uh, this late. And we're going to move you up a couple minutes. I'll get you out a little early, okay? <laughs> Good evening, Commissioners. Thank you so much for your flexibility in, in getting uh, YCB presentation up a little bit sooner. But just as by way of background, you are all aware that the Youth Coordinating Board is a multi-jurisdictional organization that is committed to supporting the health, the safety, and growth of young people in the city of Minneapolis. And uh, Michaela Ferg is going to come to talk to us about the Youth Coordinating Board's uh, Youth Master Plan. Thank you, Tyrese. Um, and thank you, um, Chair French and Commissioners. Thank you. <laughs> um, for welcoming me to your meeting to present on um, the Youth Coordinating Board's Youth Master Plan. Um, first off, I want to distinguish that um, the language of Master Plan, uh, I understand the Park Board uses, um, uses it in a different way than is intended in this document. This document more closely reflects um, a comprehensive plan that would exist in the Park Board. So it's on that like higher strategic planning level. Um, so overall, the youth master plan um, is, as Tyree said, aimed at our four jurisdictions that the Youth Coordinating Board works with, um, which includes the Park Board, Minneapolis Public Schools, the City of Minneapolis, and Hennepin County. Um, it's our strategic document that will um, guide our initiatives and work over the next five years. 
Um, this first section is, this is one of two parts. This first section really outlines the underlying framework of the plan um, and will structure these parts to come later, which I will get into later on in my presentation. Um, so yeah, so I'll first talk about um, to the, a little bit of background on the children and youth, and youth of Minneapolis, um, and then briefly go over some methods and then get into the findings um, and then talk about next steps. Um, so first of all, well, I think it's important to just a little frame and think about who are the young people of Minneapolis. Um, there's 80,000 children um, under the age of 18. The YCB, our definition of youth, goes up to 24. That includes another 56,000 individuals. Um, if you do some math, that makes up about 33% of the overall population. Geographically, young people are, co are condensed on the north side and in south Minneapolis, along the Potterhorn Park neighborhood area. That is a bit different than the distribution of all residents in Minneapolis. If we look at racial makeup, um, we see 42% of young people in Minneapolis are white, 31% are black or African American, 18% are Latinx of any race, um, which doesn't show up on the this chart because of how um, the census um, does race and ethnicity. If you look at that and compare it to all residents, um, we see it's the white to people of color ratio is essentially inverted with 64% of all residents being white and the remaining 34% being people of color. Um, so in light of some of this information, we can see that young people are different than adults in Minneapolis, thus we must treat them differently and plan for uh, making Minneapolis a youth-friendly city in a different way. As adults, um, we use some basic values to guide this work, um, which I'm just going to touch on briefly in the interest of time, um, which is just equity and justice, stability, resilience, and then collaboration and alignment of strategies, the last being the main role um, in charge of the Youth Coordinating Board. So some of our methodology in creating the Youth Master Plan um, was a lot of community outreach uh, with young people and stakeholders and young people, including youth workers. Um, we did this through a series of 13 meetings um, held across the city, um, most of which were held at recreation center facilities um, that engaged young people in this process. Um, and we also did some quicker engagement methods such as comment cards. In total, over 400 um, young people and youth workers participated. Um, so this gives us some richness of information about what young people find important um, for their lives in Minneapolis. Um, so this gave us six priorities. Um, these are really the big bucket areas, as I was talking about before, that frame um, the entire youth master plan and the work to come. Um, I will um, briefly just go over each of them. Uh, the first is youth agency. Um, that really says that youth are, ought to be active agents in shaping their futures and able to access leadership roles within their communities. Um, a lot of young people talk about power dynamics between adults and young people in their communities, um, many of which were not all too positive, um, but and people do feel empowered to um, change that and continue to build out their knowledge and leadership skills. Next priority is culturally responsive approaches, which acknowledges the role that um, race, gender, ethnicity, age, and socioeconomic status um, play in one's life. Um, a lot of young people uh, talked about in increasing racial diversity, equity, sense of togetherness and belonging, um, and also for greater representation um, with, among the adults and leaders in the communities. Um, some of this speaks to some of that demographic um, misalignment between young people and adults in Minneapolis. Next priority is gender and sexuality inclusivity, um, which touches on the um, meaningfulness of one's gender and sexual orientation. Um, young people mostly talked about this in terms of safety, um, for uh, mostly by prior to the prioritizing um, the safety of female, non-binary, and LGBTQ young people in the community, um, and also in terms of sex education, um, being much more inclusive of queer youth. Uh, next priority is social connection. As human beings, we are all incredibly social creatures. Um, this is, young people are no exception to this. Um, young people do need caring, supportive relationships in their lives. Um, but in addition to one-to-one -one relationships, um, this priority also encapsulates social capital. Um, so, talk, so thinking about what resources one person has access to in their community, what their networks look like, um, and thinking about how those might become more equitable. Um, and that part of that does include um, parks and other neighborhood amenities. Um, the fifth 
Prairie in supporting systems. Um, so that speaks more to those systems, institutions, those really large scale things, um, some of which are run by the park, some of which are run by our other three partners. Um, but certainly every young person experiences um, while living in Minneapolis. Um, there's a call for those to align more closely with principles of youth development. Um, as of now, most systems do not operate within this framework. Um, and I think we all know that that does create harm in our communities and in our young people. Um, some of the systems that young people called out specifically um, were the school system, um, which is beyond the scope of this body, um, but also community improvements. Um, most of that relate to the built environment, so that does include parks park pro and park programming. Um, although young people did, um, while expressing um, desires for expanded park facilities and uh, programming, they also did um, commend park staff and um, generally had positive experience at parks. Um, and then the final system young people called out was climate change, um, whether it's advocating for more eco-friendly forms of transportation, um, managing our waste better and creating less waste, um, and increasing environmental education among young people and all, the, all, all residents for that matter. Um, and young people, they also pointed out that climate um, and climate change is inextricably linked um, to race and income level. The final priority, um, we're almost there, is developmental needs, so that's just essentially the basic needs. Um, we all need to live in a stable environment. Um, if you think about Maslow's hierarchy of needs, the very bottom level is just your basic needs. Um, at the YCB, we take a bit of a broader view on what a basic need is, in addition to like food, clothing, shelter. Um, we also consider economic opportunity, basic education, health care. Um, those are also considered basic needs. So. Thank you for sticking through me with me through all that. Um, it's quite a lesson, so let's ramble off quickly. Um, but so the, all these priorities working together, um, as I said, kind of outline what young people in Minneapolis feel like they need um, to be active, contributing citizens. Um, so, so we are more focused on those like underlying cross-cutting mechanisms um, rather than any sort of like surface-level symptoms um, that crop up in young people's lives. Um, our next step with this plan um, is to develop some action items and strategies in collaboration with our partners um, that the YCB can um, pinpoint to kind of move the needle on some of these priorities over the next five years. Um, and then we're also working on filling in some of this um, information, some of this, some of these priorities with um, some qualitative information that allow us to assess the status of um, what young people are experiencing in relation to these priorities across the city. Um, I should also say that this report as it stands currently, though there's more work to be done on it, um, this part was presented to and approved by the YCB's board in October. Um, since then it has been taken to each of our three member jurisdictions um, to be received and filed um, in addition to my presentation to the park board today. Um, so thank you for that. Yeah. Thank you. I uh, would entertain any questions or comments uh, Commissioner Severson thank you um, I thank you for this this evening um, I think the YCB could be a true asset and gem for the north side in particular I'll, I'll honestly say that one of my biggest regrets is not being able to um, participate and be on the board of the youth coordinating board unfortunately um, I work for Minneapolis public schools and Former President Walensky and Commissioners Mucic and Forney think that I have a conflict of interest. But what really hurts me when I look at this is the um, hosting of war meetings at community tables. You guys made it to North Minneapolis only two times. And you guys went to Falwell Park and North Commons Park, which is great. But I see that the South Side has 10 times been, they had at least 10 places that they attended. And we know where the majority of kids are, right? We know where the school age kids are. It's North Minneapolis, right? If the census serves us right, which I think the trends will continue from 2010. Um, how come there weren't more events in North Minneapolis? Particularly, I'm worried, are, are wondering why they weren't hosted at North or Henry, where there's a plethora of, of kids that the YCB should be you know, targeting. Yeah, thank you for that question. Um, the war meetings were structured um, to be um, we had we hosted one meeting per each city council ward, um, which we realize is not necessarily in proportion to where young people live in the city. Mm -hmm. um, but we felt like that was the best way to engage some of our elected officials um, and our partner jurisdictions, um, considering that 
with between our four jurisdictional partners. Um, city Council has the smallest district or ward size, um, so that's the one we went with. Um, we do realize that there was some gaps in um, engaging young people through the ward meeting, so we did supplement those with some um, some of those tape dabling and quicker engagement methods. Um, but we are certainly with this plan as it's still in development, not done engaging young people in the community. Um, and I'll certainly consider looking more um, looking to get more engagement from folks on the north side. That, yeah, that would be. I would appreciate that because this is an integral part of helping our kids on the north side be successful with outside organizations. Um, the other thing that I'd like to have a conversation about is um, and I, the, the youth bus. The youth bus was a wonderful thing that we had for years. And when the YCB did the youth bus, it was phenomenal. And they handed it off to the park board and the park board dropped the ball. And it basically died. And it was a great way for our, our kids to have safe transportation from schools to parks to libraries. Uh, with safe adults uh, working it and I mean it was just it, it filled a lot of voids on um, that weren't offered by them three organizations so I hope that that's a conversation somewhere along the line that you folks want to have I know transportation is expensive but I think it was worth every single dollar that you, you folks invested into it so thank you yeah thank you <clears throat> All right. I guess any other questions from you commissioner uh, uh, I guess one of the things I, I, I did serve on the movement coordinating board for the last two years, uh, and one of the things that, and maybe I'm, this is all anecdotal, I'm, I might not have the facts like Commissioner Severs has, is it, to me, it seems like the tendency to cater to a certain group of kids that aren't normally the kids that we cater to here at the park board, and is that gonna change in the future, or is that intentional, or is it just by default? Yeah, so the young people that we engage through the youth master plan process specifically, um, and outside of the um, Minneapolis Youth Congress, young people that we um, engage as facilitators, the actual attendees um, was not necessarily, was not predetermined. Um, it was us just planning meetings, um, public publishing information about it, um, and then mostly just showing up to parks um, and seeing who walked in the door. Um, that being said, there's always room for improvement on thinking about who we're engaging. Um, I would say this, the model we use is kind of more of like a natural engagement model, um, but we could always look into it. I would, I would encourage uh, sure. the YCB to be a little bit more intentional on going to look for different demographics than they normally traditionally have dealt with. You know, and, and <clears throat> It's not just you, it's a lot of different organizations who aren't looking outside the box, but I would love, I, I bet a lot of young uh, teenagers in this in this community have never even heard of the Youth Coordinating Board. And we need to change that. And I think it's, I think it's the, the, the teens and the youth that we are connecting with, they, they, they're okay, but the teens that we're not connecting with, they don't know about the Youth Coordinating, they don't know how they can get involved in this. And I, I don't know if that's intentional or, or what, but I think we should be intentional at trying to um, grab some of those kids and getting them involved and seeing what they want and seeing what they like and what they enjoy. So that's, that's, that's all I wanted to say. And thank you for your time and thank you for being patient and appreciate your report. Thank you. All right, uh, moving on to the next study report, which was supposed to be the first study report. We had Therese Cox, assistant superintendent. She's gonna do a, a Evolution and recreation. I'm so looking forward to this. So. Thank you, Chair French. Um, as I am queuing up my presentation, I would just like to note that uh, we are in recreation are thinking about where are the opportunities for us to kind of click into some of the work that the YCB has done. Um, where do we already have alignment, and also where are the things that where we can where are the places where we can stretch our work as well. So we are this is not just a presentation for presentation's sake. We really are thinking about how the work connects. Okay, so I am looking at the So I know that you all typically appreciate my brevity and I will do my very best to not disappoint you tonight. <laughs> so uh, over time you have heard uh, 
discussions about what's coming to recreation, what's changing, and my intent tonight is to kind of uh, give you a more full picture of some of the things that you'll start to see, uh, that you've already started to see, and what kind of the full scope is, and what some of the, uh, the timelines will be. So as we think about changing and advancing some of the work in recreation, we know that an organization of this size and of this history and tradition, making some big, um, making broad changes really takes bold steps. Um, it requires us to have both an access to an, and a, a command or understanding of data. It requires that we take some calculated risk. Um, and that we have an eye towards what's emerging, what's coming in places um, outside of the state of Minnesota and perhaps outside the country. Um, and in doing so, we know some of these new things will, um, will help us expand programs and services and facilities have been identified in a variety of, uh, I'm sorry, in a variety of current and past community research. Um, and we've seen some of this show up in our service area master plans, some of our uh, request work, closing the gap work. You'll, we'll start to talk about where that shows up in this later. So how are we going to start using uh, data and recreation differently than we have in the past? We know that, and you've heard me say this many, many times, that our rec centers are intentionally unique. They are different across the city, and that's on purpose. We want our rec centers to reflect the communities they serve. We know that they offer a variety of programs, they reach broad audiences, and have a range of both facility, resource, and staffing capacities. Um, so starting to use data um, in systematic ways will help us uh, understand our current programs and help us inform new program decisions and implement continuous improvement across all of our, all of our work. Um, and again, doing so will help us enhance our program delivery. Um, so are we delivered in the ways that we intend to? Um, it help us meet, set targets and ensure that we're meeting them, and also help us understand how we're performing in our work in recreation centers. So to do that, we've been thinking about what, how do we collect data? What does that look like for us? What's our approach to it? And so we have put together a cross-functional uh, data team that comes from a variety of areas across the organization, which you'll see in, listed in front of you. But I am going to zoom down to the last four because while there is a large group that's looking at a variety of data in uh, different uh, divisions and departments, the last four in red are focused on recreation data. Um, I believe in your hands you have the Recreation Center dashboard, and this is the work that we'll be using to examine exactly what's happening in our rec centers. Um, and so you can't read it from your screen, but if you have it in your hand, this is so important because it helps us think about who are we um, in each rec center, who are the people around us, and then how are we meeting those needs, how will we measure success. And um, this is, in some ways, new for us, particularly in a systematic way. We see many things that happen kind of in isolation, but systematizing this work help us, will help us understand what we're doing well and where we have opportunities to improve. If you look at the far right side of the, of the first page, there are some, um, some conditions that help shape what can and can't happen in rec centers or it helps us understand where uh, dips in performance may, ha may be happening or give us a kind of a, a more clear picture. What I mean by that, if a center has air conditioning um, or not, that kind of dictates what we do in the hot, very hot summers. So we may start to see that internal um, programs that happen inside the center starts to take a bit of a dip because it's just too hot to do many things inside. Also, um, you may see uh, Rec Plus. Rec Plus has designated uh, space for that for our fee-based uh, childcare program, and so if this is a Rec Plus facility, then expansion um, has some uh, has a little bit of constraints inside because that space is dedicated. So again, this isn't about. Uh, what's working, what's not in that box, but it's to help us understand what can happen in each of our facilities. 
And, and I want to make sure that this is purely an example. This does not represent a single recreation center. Um, so if you zoom down, it tells us uh, how many program hours exist annually. <coughs> um, and it tells you how many programs um, were offered. And then how many participants. And it also gives you, if you just do a 2% increase of your current performance, what that will yield you um, in the next, the next year. And that's where we're starting to set goals. We're starting with something as small as 2% because 2% in one facility is a very different number than another. And again, this is to get us acclimated to how we're going to use this information and what we're going to um, review people on in the coming years. Next page is really about the um, kind of what's happening around you. What's the uh, median income and why does that matter? Because in some places, we start with the belief that people can or can't afford particular things. And, um, and in some instances, that may be accurate, but we want people to understand what's happening in the neighborhood um, with the neighbors around them. Why do businesses matter? Because for this facility who has 251 businesses in their immediate neighborhood, this may be a place where you start to think about what are some partnerships that you could tap into. Um, and what, who are, you know, what's the education level and uh, what kinds of job do people have? And again, this is really to help people um, start to think about who they're serving and what they intend to do with them and how they'll engage them. So with that information, um, we started to think about, and this is going to click a, a while, so we started to think about how do we get to innovative programs? Our, our staff, our, many of them have several years of service in the industry. They are extreme professionals and they know lots about the work that we do here. So taking what we know already and blending that with what we heard from um, some of our community engagement, either through service area master plans, requests, and some of the other things that we've done to intentionally tap into the interests of our community and blending that with looking outside of our area, again, across the country and perhaps internationally, putting those things together is where we'll start to see our innovation start to bubble up differently than we have in the past. And we're going to come back to what that looks like in just a couple of slides. So taking that, um, we are um, starting to think about what you've heard the superintendent mention as the development engine. And the development engine is a core group of staff who will be focused on advancing some of the work that you'll start to hear about in a little bit. Jamie Neldner uh, will serve as a project manager, as we've been thinking of, as kind of the architect of the work, so giving it shape. Uh, Corky Wiseman will serve as our partnership development, so how do we start to blend what exists already in the community, bringing them into this either through funding or through uh, other resources that may exist, and we think of him kind of as the amb ambassador for this work. And then the community outreach coordinators will start to activate much of uh, the things that we, we're going to talk about in a little bit. There's an asterisk next to Adelra Williams, and the reason there's an asterisk there because she will be focused largely on youth development work. Um, more specifically, uh, some of the youth line. So you uh, heard superintendent during his reports of officers talk about the week of professional development that she did with that staff. And so while she will be um, working on some of these other things as well, she will be focused largely on uh, youth development work. So where does uh, community outreach tap into this? We are going to be leveraging their expertise. They have done a tremendous amount of community engagement and will continue to use them in that way. Um, we'll position them to develop, to, to connect more deeply with community members and move from um, two relational transactions versus, versus transactional. Relational partnerships versus transactional. Um, we want them to become more knowledgeable about what's happening nationally or internationally around recreational trends, and they'll support the development engine and understanding best practices, and, and also support Jamie with uh, program placement. So this is where we go back to innovation. So if you think about where innovation, how we got to innovative programs, 
uh, balancing what or uh, connecting what we know, what we've heard, and what the trends are, and then we'll move that innovative program through the system, through the engine, and kind of the ways we just described. Um, getting them out to talk to the community about what's coming, um, starting to do option identification, where does this go, what program belongs where and why, um, and kind of go through that whole, that whole bar get to uh, evaluation, making sure that the program is doing what we intended to do, and then kind of start um, with the next either location or next project. And we're going to talk about what those projects are in just one second. So as we think about ushering in new projects or new programs, you've heard the superintendent um, talk about his six pillars, and that's what the development engine will be focused on. While there are six of them, we're going to talk more explicitly tonight about three. Um, I, we've heard many times tonight intentionality, and that's, that's really what this work is going to be about. Adding some intentionality to how we are introducing programs, how we're growing them, and where they, um, and where they kind of show up in our system. Again, we'll talk about three of the six tonight. Um, ideation spaces, youth employment, and urban ag. So, we have done a variety of visits across the city, across the metro, to look at what exists around our area of, with computer labs. We looked at uh, STEM programs, we looked at maker spaces, we went to schools and community, uh, community agencies to see what work they're doing and help that and use that to inform what we think we should have in our, in our system. And these are some interesting pictures from things that happen or just happen around us. You've heard us refer to these things as a variety of things. Ideation spaces, computer labs, tech labs, and innovation labs. And while some of those names are really common, not all of them resonate with our community. And so we wanted to think about what are we going to call them and what will they do? And one of the things we landed with was um, we want kids to be creative in their work in these spaces. And there is research that supports creativity with young people. Um, it helps change their trajectory. It helps them perform differently in school. It helps them think about their own efficacy um, in their own development. And we feel like we are positioned to help uh, kind of launch some of that, or at least expand it. So one of the things I that we really kind of keyed into in after the uh, well, second set of, of bold. When you are creative, you see problems as interesting opportunities, and you challenge assumptions and suspend judgment. You don't give up easily. And that's exactly what, what we want with our kids. That's what we want them to experience or do in our spaces. And so from that, we start to think about these as creation spaces. While that is not necessarily a branded name, it's what we want kids to experience while they're there. We want to turn on their creativity so they think differently, not just in this as they're doing whatever it is they're doing, but carry that out into the community as they're thinking about what does engineering mean? Why does this matter? What does this math problem actually mean in school? How can I resolve it differently? That's what we want to turn on. So our proposed um, creation spaces are Harrison, Whittier, and Luxton. And so that is what we are thinking as it relates to that um, pillar. The next um, pillar is youth employment, which you all have heard much about. Um, we are targeting 1,078 young people aged 14 to 24 to be employed in our system in this calendar year. We will focus on career exploration, so not just giving kids, a, making sure they get a check, that's kind of important to them, but we also want them to think about what careers are available to them, what jobs exist in, in recreation that isn't just about bouncing basketballs. Um, we want, to think about, want them to think about their own professional development and personal growth. And I'll do a full presentation on youth employment in March. Last uh, pillar that we're going to talk about tonight is urban ag, and um, 
I, we developed the Urban Act policy, I believe, back in 14. Um, but the goals, um, as they are stated in our policy right now, are in front of you. So what are the next steps for all of this? Um, next steps are rolling out the recreation dashboard and getting staff trained on how to use them, how will they, how they will be, um, how we'll work with them to understand their community and where the balance or imbalance in their program exists. We'll do that still first quarter this year. Staff and their managers will review their dashboard three times per year, and we are developing a three-year recreation data collection and evaluation plan. Why does that matter? That matters because uh, what we found as we started to look at this, we are not all thinking about um, our programs consistently. There's lots of variation in what we call a program, what we call an activity, all of those kinds of things. So we want to uniform what, so when we say X, everyone understands what that, what that means. Um, as it relates to the development engine, we've already realigned staff to start working on this. That happened still, um, just earlier in January. And then we are working on developing the work plan and implementation strategies for, the, um, for all of the work that we're doing with the engine, particularly starting with those first three pillars. The creation spaces, we are uh, engaging a youth design team so that we are getting youth voice in this, that we are not just taking off and saying, here's what we think it should be, that we want to hear from young people about one, what it feels like, what it looks like, and what actually exists inside of it. So um, as we heard Michaela talk about uh, youth agency and youth voice is really important to us as well. And so we're not just going to take off and start doing something well without hearing from them also. This summer we will be doing some teaser camps um, off site as while we are under construction in our facilities. So we want to make sure that kids get excited about what's coming as it relates to these uh, creation spaces and they'll get exposed to a variety of things that they can do um, around design work, around graphics, around engineering, all photography, audio, all the things that's possible in these kinds of spaces. We'll expose them to that during our, our teaser camp. And then lastly, in Urban Ag, as I mentioned, we adopted the plan back in 2014, and so that work is underway and we are taking the next steps, which are uh, already community gardens are being implemented. We've had, uh, we'll have our first family cultivated plots in 2020, and then uh, we are hiring a community garden coordinator. Um, that work is in process now. So, um, in transforming recreation, as an urban organization with a history of responding to the needs and interests of its users, we have a tremendous opportunity to continue to stretch our boundaries, to set programmatic trends, imagine what is beyond our current offerings, and expose users to more than they envision. Um, I will take any questions if you have them. Thank you, Assistant Superintendent Cox. I believe Commissioner Severson was first. Thank you. Appreciate you, Chair. <coughs> oh, man, like, I'm feeling all type of ways right now about <laughs> this. Um, first, I want to say this collecting data, it, I mean, great, but to me, what I see is less programming. I see directors more focused on pushing these numbers instead of pushing out programs. And I've heard that out of a few of their mouths. And that's a concern for mine. Uh, for me, when it's more important to rent my gym out because I got to meet a quota than it is to allow the kids in the community to the gym to keep them busy to play for free. That's a serious issue for me. Um, one thing I'm extremely frustrated about is we have cycling on here, but we don't have athletics on here. Athletics is dwindling in Minneapolis, and I don't know, I don't understand how to communicate it to you folks how important it is, particularly for my community to have space available and for us to invest in good athletic programming. Um, we know that it works, right? So I, I feel like we're trying to reinvent the wheel. Like, oh, you don't, like you said, not just bouncing a ball. Well, some people really enjoy bouncing a ball, even all the way into adulthood, right? Um, so if this works, why are we investing in things that work? And we're, it's like we're trying to recreate this wheel. I feel like personally we're investing more in adult sports than we are in youth sports. And for me, that's an issue. And I'd actually, I'd like to challenge you on that and see how much staff time are we putting into adult sports versus youth sports? I think it might be captivating to 
to see what that looks like. Um, the question I have for you is we're putting this ideation space at Harrison. What about rec plus, the free Rec Plus program? Is, is there space at Harrison for that as well? If this ideation space goes in? Uh, Chair French, Commissioner Severson, um, I'd like to address both of your comments. May I start mm -hmm. with the former? Yes. Um, as it relates to renting the gym and capturing data, those are two very different issues. So if we're talking about uh, renting the gym, that's a funding issue. What we're asking people to look at is what are you doing and why? And so one of the examples that I give, if you look at your data and it tells you that 70% of your neighborhood population is over 55, but you only have 3% of 55 plus programming, we want you to, to be thinking about why is that? And so, and what can we do differently? This is, not, we are not starting with, uh, with penalty in this. We're really starting with getting people to think about what you're doing and why you're doing it. And we are, we want to, we want to support you through that. And so, that's kind of the, what I see as the distinction between those two things. Um, and then to go to your question about Harrison and uh, with the, Creation Space and Rec Plus. We are waiting to hear from uh, Department of Human Services to come out and do a. Their I don't know so, how. So there's space for both of those. That's what, yep, okay. what we're believing. Yep, that's what we're believing. And so that's what we are starting with, and we need for DHS to give us the yes for that. Okay. Um, a few other questions. So community outreach. We're going to invest a lot of time in this, right? I would love to see community outreach knocking on doors and reaching out to people that we haven't reached out to yet. I would like to see them, instead of talking at people at events, asking people what they want to see. These are the complaints that I've heard from people uh, about our staff going out. Like they, they sit at tables, they're, they're not engaging people, and I just want to know why we're not hitting doors and reaching out to people. One of the, the toughest stories that I heard um, and, and this is a bit of an old story, but still I, I think it's, it's worth sharing. Uh, when I worked at Falwell Park, we could not figure out why we could not attract Hmong families to that park. And we finally had an opportunity to, to speak with them because they had a, a repass, and I don't know if that's the right word to use for their culture. But at, at the park next to the cemetery, it was an opportunity to engage them if, if they were willing. They thought Falwell was a cemetery. They didn't come to, this was a wide open green space. They thought this Fowell Park was a cemetery. It was next to the cemetery that was been, that's what they thought. This, and they wanted to respect the space and not be there. So I'm, I'm just concerned that <coughs> we're focusing on this here when I feel like we should be on the doors with the programming that we have. I look at some of the north side parks, we're way down in numbers again. There's no way we should be down in numbers for basketball. There's, there's no reason other than we're not outreaching, letting, and, and, and the thing that we know about North Minneapolis, it's a very transient population. We know this. Families are coming and going, particularly with people with, with school-age children. So I would like to recharge and, and have you guys consider what community outreach is really doing with that and maybe get them on the doors and communities and, and that look like uh, mine in North Minneapolis. Um, last but not least, I was a director at this park. I, I, I was a director at Corcoran Park, and I think what they thought is we were going to, it's a small park, doesn't have air conditioning, um, but it has a lot of assets. And, and my supervisor at the time was good old Mary Kay Wittick, and I loved her. And Mary Kay Wittick said, I said, I want to start some athletic programs. She said, well, it's going to be tough, because everyone goes to Powderhorn Park. Before we knew it, we had two football teams, right? We had volleyball teams that were using other spaces, gyms for practice. So I hope you charge and, and give directors the ability to be successful in, in their communities instead of having them chase down statistics. And I know, understand this is important, but the, the working with our youth is more important um, than chasing down uh, statistics and have them entering this in and trying to make sure this looks good for you folks instead of looking good directly in the community. Commissioner Stevenson, thank you so much. I actually think you are supporting our, um, our argument, right? And so getting people to think about what exists um, get, 
it's really why we're, so that one, they're not producing the data. The data will be produced by the, by the data team. So a uh, rec specialist won't be burdened with coming up with it. It will already exist through what you've done in ActiveNet, um, how you are, so that already exists for them. We'll just be compiling it and producing it in ways that, that they can digest, right? So, so. I mean, that's a little bit of a stretch. I don't know if I would say I support it because we're not filling up our gyms for basketball, but we're going to support cycling and we're going to take outreach staff to support cycling. Well, what I will I, say, I don't support that. What I will say is this. Um, I'm not sure if door knocking was figurative or not, but what I, what I will say is that we are trained in IAP2, which is an engagement, uh, international engagement strategy, and we will be clear about where are the times that we are actually doing true engagement and where are the places we are doing in, informing, because there's a spectrum of how we connect with communities. And so there will be times when we start to map out what's the strategy that we're using um, to make sure that the community understands what we're asking, what we're doing, where we're going. And so that would be part of the work that, so on that continuum that you, um, let me see if I can get to it quickly. Um, slide number 13 is where we'll start to do some of that, where we'll start to map out what the strategies are. I appreciate you, Superintendent, mm -hmm. you're stellar. Thank you, Commissioner Severson. Uh, Commissioner Musich. Thank you, Chair French. <clears throat> um, so I'm excited to see that we're finally getting to a place where we have data to help us better understand where we have uh, service gaps and opportunities to enhance them. Uh, I've been always very disappointed in how underutilized many of the rec centers in my district have appeared to be when I've gone to them to stop in and say hi and see what's going on. Uh, so I'm, I'm pleased to see that we're making some strides in providing our rec center directors with data to help them uh, get away from that empty building syndrome. Uh, are we using Power BI to produce these reports for our staff? Uh, Chair French, Commission Usage, yes we are. Okay, so Power BI has the ability to be an interactive software component, not just a printed out paper copy. Are we providing our staff with interactive reporting so they're able to see the data that is backing up what they're seeing in the active images, or are we just giving them a static report to work off of? Let me say this to you. That question is a little bit lost on me. I'm going to leave that to the folks on page six, um, the the data team. Okay. Um, I am I'm not super versed in all that Power BI can do, and so I certainly can come back with that, but I, I don't know the, okay. the ins and outs of it. Is it okay if sure. I reach out directly to the people that are on the data team to ask that question? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Chair French, uh, Commissioner okay. Usage, it is also, it is interactive. Okay. Uh, what we've been trained, we, when I brought this forward, we were using it, we started using it in Mecklenburg, but it's been used all over the country, different park and recreation systems. The beauty of Power BI, as you know, is immediate. You yep. can see it directly, you can have your phone, your laptop, you can have your desktop, you can see directly at the moment. Uh, Commissioner can ask us specifically, can you tell me the numbers that we have currently, whatever, it's immediate, we can pick it up, we'll be able to then give direct uh, information. Um, I don't know if staff at this point is going to have it directly in front of them right now, and we give them reports, but we do have the capability of doing that with staff, and they can have that available to them at any time they need to access it. Tyrese can go on, and we can go on it, uh, but again, I don't want to uh, step my boundaries. I know they're still working through this, and we still have a lot to kind of move forward in it, but it is an active system, so. Okay, um, so I use Power BI in my day job, and that's why I asked, because mm -hmm. part of the value in utilizing that piece of software is that you get the opportunity to be able to dig deeper into the data that's being visualized for you, so that if you do have the technical expertise or the desire to um, develop that, you can really make that data work for you in a way that you can't when you just have a piece of paper in front of you. <clears throat> um, so I would hope that we work towards that goal um, at some point. I'd also love to be able to see um, these rec recreation center summaries for my district. Mm -hmm. uh, so if those could be provided to us, that would be great. Is, is that something that can be done? I'm a little, I'm a little concerned I've overstepped boundaries by the look on your face. 
May I ask that you let me sit with that thinking for a while? And the reason I say that, uh, sharing is not the problem. We promised um, the rec specialist kind of out the gate that this wouldn't be punitive. And what I don't want to, them to feel like that this is a step towards, you know, we want them to get used to it first. Yep. And so can I just gauge a little bit of their comfort with, with knowing that others are looking, but there, there isn't punishment behind us, behind them right now. Is that okay? Yeah, I mean, I'm just curious. I don't intend to tell someone they're not doing their job well. Um, <clears throat> I'm also wondering, so part of the data that's shared on here is um, a percent increase in goals that are being outlined for um, staff to try to achieve for their location. Um, is there data somewhere on a different page, perhaps, that demonstrates what the total capacity is in each of these categories for that particular site? Uh, I don't know that uh, that we have wholly, you can only go up six more. Um, we have not started there, and I anticipate that as we get into this, we will. this will evolve over time. We'll start to recognize what information serves us best, what really gets us at what we, what we need. We needed a place to start, and where we wanted to start is people looking at their rec center um, and really how it's performing. Uh, and not in comparison to anyone else. So we're not saying you're comparison really well compared to this one. Where are you and what can you do differently? So that's kind of what we're starting, but I expect that it'll evolve over time. Okay. So the, the recreation center director isn't going to know what their total capacity are. That They're only going to know what their target increases are for each of these categories. For now. Okay. I find that a little confusing as someone that does a lot of data analytics, I would think that you would want, you'd want that full picture of what the capacity is and so that, so that you understand really how much um, opportunity there is for that to change year over year. Because typically the way that work works for me is that if I perform to a certain level, I'm expected to do even more the next year. And I, I would like people to have a better picture of what the full potential is for them at their location. We can explore that. Um, <clears throat> you had talked about trying to find um, a name for the ideation spaces that really resonated with people. And I guess I'm wondering if maker spaces was ever considered, since that's a common um, phraseology that's utilized all over the country and that people may have familiarity with, especially if they have Project Lead the Way or other um, STEM programs in their schools, as the schools do expose them to maker spaces in the city. So we did look at maker spaces, and at least what we saw locally, maker spaces oftentimes were people that were uh, were spaces where people were somewhat novice already, and so at least the ones that we visited, right? So if there's someone who is already familiar with using stuff I don't use, drills and, and those kinds of things. So it's novice. Um, and so um, might there be a little, little bit of um, implied expectation that you kind of show up and already know stuff? Maybe, maybe not. But, you know, I, I think I'm less concerned about the branding, I will leave that to the other folks that are more concerned about branding. I'm concerned about what kids experience while they're there. But again, we can we can revisit that as well. Okay. It was just a suggestion since mm -hmm. I thought the goal was to try to find something that resonated with people. Um, and that's something that's already out there in the world. Um, that, was, that was all my questions. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you, Commissioner Musich. Uh, Commissioner Farney. Thank you, Chair uh, French. I'm not on this committee, and um, so I apologize. I know the late hour and everything, but um, I know it's hard for everybody to believe, but my beginning career was in social work, and um, actually my first job was at Phyllis Wheatley. I started going through my head all the different places that I worked, and none of them were with, with the parks. I mean, I worked at the Pill House, I worked at the Wade House, the Loring Nicollet, anyway. And I'm wondering, in the survey, in the, or, uh, the work that you have all been doing, and also YCB, I didn't hear what are other entities offering. I don't want to say competition, but you know, um, 
if their fun funding source is different, and so therefore they're able maybe to do things more, I don't, I don't know if these are the right words, but more effectively. Anyway, have we, should we say, um, uh, created you know, a, a database of what other entities are working in, I mean, in particular, I know um, Commissioner Severson keeps on articulating North Minneapolis. I know that there's an awful lot of groups, I mean, like just supposition, uh, that are doing very, very, very good work that are outside the park system. And have we evaluated that as well? Like I said, it's not competition, but who's offering similar services that what we would like to do? And so therefore, you know, are we, is there really a void? I mean, I don't mean to say that, yes, we always can use more um, activities, but um, I just feel like there's something that was missing there when I'm hearing both the YCV and yours is that are we looking at what the a column private entities are also doing and maybe they can deliver better than we can. Commissioner Muse, uh, sorry, Forney, uh, I'm not sure that I'm going to actually get at your question, but what I will say is this. We are examining what are the things that we can do because there are more young people that need to be served than there are services. So we're looking at that. But we're also looking at where are the opportunities for us to work with some other people because we don't feel like we have to do everything. There are some okay. things that there just aren't enough of, but there are some other things that Organization X is the expert in whatever. Right. And they're where, how can we partner with them? Mm -hmm. And so we are starting to, to think about what does partnership look like differently in recreation than we have before, and where are the places where is it, there just isn't enough of dot, dot, dot. Da, right, exactly. And that's several, many more of us should be doubling down on those things. So we're starting to think about oh, good. Where, where that exists. Good, and that's like I said, I felt like something was missing there. And then I just have to ask the question, how are we doing as far as um, seven day um, being open seven days a week? I know we have a few, but uh, are we advancing in that area? Um, Commissioner Forney, uh, unfortunately, I don't have that in my head at this moment. What I can do is I can come back with um, the facilities that we open seven days, where we've seen spikes in um, participation, where we're not, and I, I simply don't know that tonight. That's fine. Thank you. Thank you for the presentation. Thank you, Commissioner Farney. Are you, are you done? Oh, yes. I'm sorry. Uh, cool. uh, <clears throat> I, uh, first of all, I want to say thank you because this is something that we as commissioners ask for. We ask for, for some change in the, rec, in the rec program. We thought it could be a little bit uh, more robust. And in some of the conversations I had uh, over the summer about adding to uh, funding to our, some of our rec programming, and there was some... Uh, there were some questions about uh, the, the, uh, the potency of our rec our work programming, and I am glad to see that there's been some change and some movement on some of our programming in our rec in our rec centers. Uh, I, I share uh, Commissioner Stevens' uh, concern that our our, um, our our directors are being uh, told to keep a, a large amounts of data. I'm, I'm a youth worker. I've worked in schools for a long time, and I know what it's like when teachers are told to. This data is important. It becomes more of a, a more of an issue than actual teaching. Uh, but I'm, I, with all that being said, I think this is a uh, this is great. I think it's new. Only thing constant in the world is change. So change is good because our kids change uh, every year. We get a I, you know I worked in high school for about almost two decades and I. There was a new trend coming, like every two or three years. It was like, dang, it was just this, and how's this? So change is good for youth because by the time we figure it out, they're on to something new. So uh, I just want to thank you and your staff for putting this together, and hopefully we can uh, do some work with Commissioner Severson. If one day we'll make them happy about the stuff, completely happy about the stuff that we that we do in the rec recreation department. He he, he challenges me. Uh, uh, making sure our, we have what we need for our kids. So I, I appreciate that, Commissioner Severson, for uh, keeping me uh, kind of in check when it comes to making sure our kids have what they need, especially on the north side. Uh, that being said, any more questions, anything else? I would just like to say thank you, and I would entertain a motion to adjourn the Recreation Committee. Oh, I'm sorry. Chair Friendship.
I have, I, this is not on your presentation, thank oh. you very much. Um, it's been about a year since I initially requested a study report item on the current state of the science around the impacts of tackle football and youth short and long-term brain health. And so I'm just reiterating that request again that we be updated on the state of the science on that topic. Commissioner Usage, uh, can we make a note, can we give a note to, to maybe we can work on something like that in the future? I'm sorry. Uh, a study on the... A study uh, report item on the current state of the science around the impacts of tackle football on youth short and long-term brain health. I would add soccer to that. Yeah, I mean, unfortunately, can, there, can, can there's not a lot of... Period? Yeah, there's just not a lot of studies on soccer. The Most of them are on tackle football. But I, so, I, I mean, it would apply either way. My, my main concern is um, the reports I've read indicate that there's certain age groups that shouldn't be engaged in any sort of um, tackle sports because it, they see a higher percentage of Im impact later in life. And so this is, I would just like somebody who's better at finding that information <laughs> well, to bring us up to speed. I think that's an off subject, but I do, I know I'm, I, I, the statistic, uh, I think the sport that kids get hurt most in is girls soccer. I think that's the, I think that's the, where the most concussions come from. Just throwing that out there, I'm just a, I'm a, a stat, a stat nerd. Uh, so thank you. I would entertain a motion to adjourn the Recreation Committee. So moved. All, all those in favor of adjourning, say aye. 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 All opposed? Extensions? We are adjourned. I'd like to call the Administration and Finance Committee to order. The Secretary, please call me. Oh. At 10.13, I think we are. P.M. Commissioner Musich. Present. Commissioner French. Here. Chair Forney. Here. You have a quorum. Thank you. I'll take a motion to approve the agenda. So moved. All those in, oh, yeah. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? I'll take a motion to approve the minutes of Wednesday, January 22nd, 2020. So moved. Thank you. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, so moved. Okay, we've got two action items. If somebody would please read the first resolution. Resolution 2020-113, resolution amending chapter uh, 15 of the Minnesota Park and Recreation Board, Code of Ordinance relating to wait, the park... I have a different agenda for you. Oh, yeah, well, oh that's we're January we're 22nd. 22nd. Sorry. Here, I'll read it. <laughs> um, I'll move resolution 2020 129, a resolution awarding a construction contract to Veeton Company, Inc., in the amount of $731,446.76 for the phase one improvements, rebid project in Falwell Park, per event number 771 pending approval by City of Minneapolis Procurement Division and Civil Rights Department and authorizing administrative use of a 5% construction contingency up to $36,572.34 for necessary construction change orders that may arise with the contract and authorizing the transfer of $40,000 from the 2020 MPP20 Capital Investment Construction Contingency Fund. Could this be any longer, you guys? <laughs> <laughs> and amending the Minneapolis Park and Recreation Board 2019 Capital Improvement Program to include the allocation of $23,869.80 to the Phase 1 Improvements Rebid Project in Follow Park and the Follow Neighborhood Portion of the Parkland Dedication Fund. <laughs> yeah. Any Ooh. questions that people have on this resolution? The presentation needed? Anything? Okay. No. All those in favor of the resolution, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? That is moved. Okay. I'll move um, resolution 2021-30, a resolution to approve the submission of the Minnesota Department of Natural Resources Federal Recreational Trail Program grant application for up to $100,000 for natural surface trail improvements, maintenance, and signage improvements at Theater Worth Regional Park and Brownie Lake Park within Chain of Lakes Regional Park. Any discussion on that item, presentation, or anything? Nope, it's awesome. Let's vote. What? I said, nope, it's awesome. Let's vote. <laughs> <laughs> No, I got to look at it. Okay, well, I think this is the fastest meeting. Anyway, all those in favor um, of uh, uh, Resolution 2021 30, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Uh, opposed? Abstentions? I'll take a motion then to adjourn. So moved. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Okay, we adjourn. Woo.
Oh, yeah, that's it's <laughs> For anyone watching on TV, I will now be calling the planning committee because our one item was removed. Thank you. Oh, fine. <laughs>